All right, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to stand and talk in front of this all the time or not. I'm hoping, hoping not. Well, if you can't hear me, let me know. Um, so we're going to be rambling around quite a bit in the bigger picture of our, uh, the challenges of our time, I guess I would say. And uh, so uh, regenerative agriculture is, is kind of our starting point, but I'd like to nest that within a larger conversation about <clears throat> regenerative economy and regenerative culture. I think we really need to look at the supply chains of everything we're doing, not just food, as uh, the effects of that on the natural capital that's um, allowing for biodiversity to exist, which is us. So. Um, I think what we're really looking at here is, uh, is restoring, uh, at the end of the day, it's really restoring our relationship to the natural world. There's a lot of talking about, uh, you know, things that look external, and we do this out here, we do this out there, but quite a bit of this process is really getting back to who we really are, and, and in my opinion, we've lost, uh, we've lost track of the, of the original um, purpose, I, I guess I might say. What I mean by that is I think that we, are, uh, we come from a very deep um, co-evolutionary symbiotic place of stewardship, uh, which is a, uh, might look at it as a keystone species, is, my, is what I believe our role to be. Uh, we've come clearly very far from that. Uh, we all know that here, so I don't, I'm not going to dwell too much on the problems. Uh, however, they're very acute, and the, um, <clears throat> the odds that we require to make it through these challenges is quite high. Um, however, the odds of being here in the first place is even higher. So uh, we need to remember that, that we're really in the middle of a pretty miraculous uh, process of life. So uh, we need to counterbalance those, those things. So uh, in the mid-90s, I went to Tibet and had a pretty profound experience in the Himalaya. And when I came back, I read this book that was, I thought, quite extraordinary called uh, The Heart of the World. And what, what's relevant about this is that uh, the book was written about the, the Shangri-La stories in, in that part of the world. And what was, I thought, brilliant about it is that we, he wrote it uh, simultaneously as a geographic and psychological process, that you, could, you couldn't just be transported to this place and you're in Shangri-La. You had to be there here as well. And so I think what we're doing is looking at uh, restoring a lot of, really at the essence, connectivity, uh, communication connectivity. And I think that uh, in order to do the work that we're talking about for the long haul, to stay on track, <clears throat> to not get distracted, to have the energy to do it, all of that is connected to a process that's linking our brain to our heart. I think the heart is really the, probably the center of the whole thing, but uh, there's, there's a lot of interesting emerging information about the vagus nerve that wraps around the brain, connects the heart to the, to the gut. And then the gut is in communication with the soil through our food. When we, when we eat local food, we're communicating with the microbes in our local soils. And then the, <clears throat> the soils are, are constantly interacting with everything else in the landscape. And when we walk in the woods or we walk in the prairies or swamps, we're breathing in DNA that's being incorporated into our microbiome. And we're profoundly... Uh, um, more informed in our bodies than we are with just human DNA. Um, this is pretty critical in this whole process because I think that most of our problems uh, in the past have been derived from our sense of self that is separate from this whole larger superorganism of sorts. And once we realize that we are an integral part of this thing, the whole story changes. And regeneration or uh, improvement in, on any level is improving things at, at the other levels. Um, so I felt like I needed to mention that before we got into uh, just sort of standard um, regenerative agricultural things. Um, my process started quite a long time ago um, in, <clears throat> as a child, I think, in a just a typical curious kid with some uh, 
strong interest in the natural world and some profound experiences that began arising from that process. And I think that that's another piece of the energetics of this whole thing is um, how we, <laughs> what we tap into um, in order to serve this larger system. Uh, to me, comes out of that curiosity process, and is it, it leads you into this uh, obvious beauty in the world, and uh, then a, a sense of wonder and a sense of gratitude, which ripens, for me anyway, into a sense of reciprocity and um, stewardship. So that's kind of where we're, we're going with all of this. Um, so I can skip forward a little bit in my life and, and talk about the, uh, you know, my, my initial studies were in wildlife biology, and um, I really became interested in what a person could do to assist or improve the life of a given species and looking at its habitat. And as I started looking at different habitats of species and then uh, bigger and bigger composites of habitats and some species that require a lot of other species' habitats to be intact to, to exist, um, I, I came up to this idea of, or concept of carrying capacity, that, that landscapes can support life at different levels depending on a number of conditions. And over time, uh, natural systems build these conditions to be more and more biodiverse, so like a biological flywheel of sorts that um, is really kind of preparing for disturbances in the, in the long run. And so diversity is, is really a critical piece of resilience. And uh, this is what we have been methodically removing from all human systems is, is resilience. And so restoring diversity is, is a really key piece of this. Um, as I moved through that thinking, I eventually came to look at human beings as one of the wildlife that I was studying. And that led uh, <clears throat> into, a, unfortunately, an esoteric subject. It's, it should be, I, I think, very uh, um, well taught in universities. But in academia, looking at what is good human habitat from that same perspective as, as a, any other you know, species is not very well explored, in my opinion. So that put me off into a territory of uh, um, anthropology and ethnobotany and uh, philosophy and eventually took me into, uh, well, I'll get to that in a moment, um, but I found myself in real need of functional reference points, of things that were working, not just trying to improve on things that were broken. And, and I think this, this is a really common problem and uh, um, things that are holding a lot of well-meaning people back is that if you can look at, at a, say our mainstream society, the dysfunction is so profound that it's incredibly easy to make improvements and, and get better, and it feels good to do that. However, it doesn't give you a very clear sense of where we're headed. So if we identify really highly functional biological systems, and particularly ones with human culture that has uh, evolved or adapted to that over very long periods of time, then we have some real, uh, really good material to keep us on track for the long haul. Um, and so, uh, I don't know if people can read that or can't. Should, should we read it or we, can we move on here? Uh, it's, it's basically looking at a lot of what I was just saying about increasing biodiversity, enriching soils, improving watersheds, enhancing ecosystem services, which we'll get into all of these things, uh, capturing carbon and soil above and, uh, and below ground, uh, reversing current global trends and atmospheric accumulation uh, of CO2, at uh, the same time in offering increased yields, resilience to climate instability, higher health and vitality for farming and ranching communities, um, drawing from decades of scientific and applied research for global communities of organic farming, agroecology, holistic management, and agroforestry. I would also strongly add <clears throat> the traditional environmental knowledge of indigenous cultures into this. Um, that's really where my sense of what our potential came from. Um, I spent some time with... Um, with a man named uh, Dennis Martinez on the West Coast, who's a, a brilliant um, indigenous man who um, has this unique 
knowledge base uh, because he simultaneously has this indigenous training from tribal elders and he's got a, a PhD in evolutionary ecology from, the, from the, the academic world. So he can literally in one mind just say, here's where the weaknesses of this system are and here's where the weaknesses of this system are instead of having the native peoples over here and the scientists over here having a conversation. And um, he's, he's got a, a tremendous depth of knowledge about prescription burning and the use of fire to, to move ecosystems toward a set point of productivity for a wide range of wildlife and salmon habitat and um, basket plant materials and tubers and, and uh, so forth. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, I don't, I don't want to miss that, and we'll get back to that in a bit. Um, a lot of this has to do with translocating carbon. We just, we just mismanage. We're shuffling the carbon around the planet in the wrong places, and uh, we're hearing a lot about it. I think we're hearing too much about CO2 as the primary driver of the, uh, of the climate, which it's uh, deeply involved in, but not to the story that we're, we've heard. And, um, but I wanted to say that uh, instead of demonizing carbon, uh, carbon is really uh, at the core of life and who we are and what everything is about. Um, Wade Davis, the anthropology, anthropologist, once said that um, spirit rides the horse of, of matter. And I would put carbon in this place at this point. Um, so just wanted to say that, that, that this carbon, and we'll talk about uh, using this problematic carbon in the atmosphere to translocate that to optimal places for biodiversity and resilience and health. Uh, so again, you know, spirit rides the horse of matter, and uh, these are strong, uh, for me, ha have, have been a, a whole series of very powerful uh, encounters, I guess I would say, that, that really fused that sense of who I am to be something much different than uh, an isolated human being in time and space and uh, disconnected from, um, from the rest of the, this system uh, to where you can actually really feel it. That's, that, it's not just a hearing about it or understanding it from reading something, but when you're feeling that connection, uh, some, some really primary changes happen in your, in your being. And I think that it's uh, uh, critical stuff for how we operate um, down the line. Um, so I became aware of, uh, in my studies, that um, a lot of the diversity of the, of the planet was happening in the tropics. Um, at that time, I didn't really understand soil uh, microbiology and the diversity there, but I was dazzled by what I could see above ground at that point, and it was very clear that there was a lot happening in the tropics. Um, I made my first trip in the early 80s, um, and it was partly looking for these functional reference points. It was partly looking for, for reference points that had uh, human uh, engagement in it for very long periods of time. And um, I was also looking for, I was becoming more and more aware of the tremendous amount of subsidies in our world here. Uh, and it's, it's incredibly difficult to see past them. Um, the amount of subsidies in just our daily life is dazzling. <laughs> you know, I was, uh, I was at Penn State about 25 years ago, and it was really starting to bother me that um, the language that we were using to talk about um, primitive people, uh, uh, underdeveloped countries, um, et cetera, and, uh, and that this educated, developed world superiority was making less and less sense to me. And there was a course that was um, <clears throat> in the engineering department on ethics and the design of technology. And uh, so I just did a, a thought process for them just to start it all off and just looking at the simplest possible end of the story, which is thermodynamics of calories in, calories out to see who was developed and who was educated and who was backward and so forth uh, for real. And modern agriculture is using between 10 and 20 calories, I would say conservatively, uh, for every one coming out. Um, and some of these primitive uneducated peoples are using as little as a 50th of a calorie. So there's a thousand fold difference in thermodynamic energy of uh, production. Now it's all hidden in fossil fuels and, and large tractors and 
uh, air conditioned cabs and travel and packaging and you know it's very hard to wrap your mind around it we we desperately need feedback you know that was the other piece about the connectivity is that we we're missing feedback if we're buying products that come from all around the world uh, we're robbed of that feedback uh, if you're doing something even poorly locally you're getting to see the results of that poor or good uh, feedback and you can learn and evolve um, uh, there was an anthropologist named Stanley Diamond that talked about cultures being uh, ecosystem cultures versus biosphere cultures. And what he meant by that was <laughs> cultures that were really learned to live within the ecosystem they were at and biosphere cultures, ones that were drawing, like uh, having tentacles reaching out all over the biosphere and they were not as tuned to the place that they were in. So to develop a sense of place, you really have to kind of pull off those artificial subsidies, at least for a while, to see clearly, to see the, to be able to, you know, have glasses that sees your relationship to carbon and genetic information and um, energy. So I did my first trip to Central America, really not expecting too much. Um, I kind of got drawn in very quickly into the southern part. Let's see if I can figure out the pointer. Um, no, nope. I don't want to mess with this. Anyway, uh, southern Belize in the Maya Mountains uh, of, uh, near the Guatemala border um, is a very interesting and unique area. Um, it was immediately what I was looking for that I couldn't get out of an academic setting. Um, no roads going in, just dugout canoe access, uh, all hand tools at least 95% of the population was farming. Uh, not only farming, but building their own homes um, from local materials, uh, using, their, using medicine, and pretty much the whole economy was coming from the landscape. And uh, young kids could tell you uses of plants that were, would be esoteric in uh, most of where, where I came from. Um, it's a very interesting region because it's karst limestone and it has up to 200 inches of rain a year. Uh, and that washes through huge cave systems and underground rivers and very beautiful, mysterious place that, to hike into and kind of get back to the origins of things. And I started, uh, I set up a, a learning center, an agroforestry uh, research center, and was bringing students from many universities from all over the country down for uh, immersion uh, experiences and um, experiential curriculums that were getting to what I was wishing I had access to when I was in school and I had to leave because it wasn't there so instead of being uh, angry about that I just produced what I wished I had um, and offered this for 25 years to about you know, a couple couple dozen universities that I worked with, and some of them ran for 15, 20 years. But to, just to watch what happens with people um, by reconnecting everything in your life back to the landscape, back to a, a plant or a process, or, you know, and then all the cycles that are involved in that, from the time of the moon that you cut the vines to tie your, your leaf on well, for your roof, and uh, um, what plants to use for what, and then watching the animals, watching the uh, behavior of animals that you're uh, hunting in a lot of cases, um, but but being very aware of the population dynamics of those animals you're hunting to make sure there's going to be plenty down the line. Um, all powerful things. Uh, it's a northern northern version of a, of a type of tropical forest that um, is that kind of at its northern edge. Um, going south from here, there's there's lots more, but it's a it's a a mixed, um, really much taller tropical forest than you would find, say, a just a little bit north in the Yucatan. Um, beautiful wild place. So I started to look at these unsubsidized systems, and, and, and even the, uh, uh, it's not just the human culture that's unsubsidized by fossil fuels and by um, uh, disproportionate economic relationships with other countries and access to resources that are unfair and, and so forth, those types of subsidies, but also um, came to realize that the soils are so thin 
that um, we, we, we're riding down this bank of soil for hundreds of years, you know, and we've done a, an incredible job of wearing it out. And it's, uh, the soil is so key to us up here, and it's just it's less of a focus there because the, the temperatures are so high and the oxidation is so fast that it's very difficult to keep carbon in the soil for any length of time very thin, poor soil. So the, the functionality kind of rises more above ground into the, the structure of the forest, and it's tremendously complex and interesting and gives you some of the best tools, I think, out there for designing with, uh, learning how to design without fossil fuels, without um, soil to a large degree. Uh, so very complex nutrient cycling systems and tremendous number of relationships between organisms that, that uh, allow that to happen. Um, I think we've got plenty of time, so if there's questions, we can do that any time, but otherwise we'll wait till a little bit later and get into it. Um, so this was a type of farming that really interested me because we didn't have to deal anybody out. You know, there's five species of wild cats on the farm, and um, it, it's part of a... Um, it's, it's on the edge of a forest reserve that is uninhabited for about 90 miles. And um, so there's a lot of wild species here. These are jaguar tracks. Uh, so while you're out, you know, picking coffee or planting, uh, all we we had at least 200 species of, of uh, crop plants. When I say crop, that's it's a useful plant. I, I think that weeds are are basically um, an idea that uh, comes to people who haven't been where they are long enough. Um, because almost everything has a use, and even the plants that aren't maybe directly used, they are recognized to be pollinator plants or, um, uh, you know, all sorts of ecosystem functions that are needed for the ones that you are growing. So there's a whole relationship of, of diversity that in our thinking, right? There's intended diversity and there's associated diversity. And the more intended diversity that we have, the more associated diversity we're going to have. So it's very important for us to diversify our thinking about whatever supply chain we are interested in. And uh, I, I would include, uh, later on we'll, we'll look at energy and, and how to get off this uh, fossil fuel shuffle uh, and get back to the present solar economy. And that's really what is uh, happening in this type of place. So when you look at all these species and the relationships between them, uh, you start to see a, a phenomenal amount of uh, mutualism and um, symbiotic relationships in this mix. I think we've, been, we've taken this survival of the fittest thing a little bit the wrong direction in the sense that um, it isn't so much you know, the, the strongest surviving, but it's uh, people familiar with Lynn Margulis's work. Um, she's done a lot of interesting um, work with this idea. And um, Lynn Margulis. Essentially, it looks like that aggression in the natural world is uh, responded to by cooperation as a, uh, as a response to aggression, and that the cooperative uh, traits have a longer survival value than the, than the aggression. So I think I would say survival of the fittest communities uh, as, a, as opposed to survival of the fittest individuals, and then we're getting closer. So the this is a, an acacia species with a... Most plants in the tropics are producing secondary compounds that are targeting herbivore uh, digestive systems uh, to protect themselves, right? So some plants don't have any of that, and this plant is one of them. Um, and in, as an alternative to producing chemistry to protect itself, it has developed a relationship with an ant species and the ants live in these hollow thorns. It's blurry a little bit, but you can see a little hole there. They drill holes in those thorns and live inside them. And then the plant produces uh, extra floral nectaries, little drinking fountains of sugar water for them, uh, and these other uh, Belgian bodies that they, they feed. They're, they're like fruits for the ants. And in exchange, the ants protect this tree completely. If you lean on this tree and you don't get hit by a thorn, uh, you'll quickly get covered with ants that have extremely hot bites. There's, they're, they're like uh, bee stings. Um, and they'll, if, a, uh, if a vine goes to wrap around this, a tendril wraps around it, they'll go over and chew that and 
drop the vine off. So they, 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 they're working together uh, mutually. And you see literally thousands, and th everywhere you look, you see these types of relationships. There's ants that, that grow fungi underground. Um, and they, they've lost, the, the fungi has lost the ability to make fruiting bodies and spores, but it relies on the ants to move its culture uh, from un underground to underground uh, gardens. Um, so endless amounts of this. The reason I, I mention it mainly is that I think that humans have not uh, optimized, <laughs> you know, to put it lightly, the possibilities that we have for, for mutualism and symbiotic relationships as opposed to uh, much more destructive one-way relationships. And um, so part of this whole thing is you have to make some decisions about what kind of relationships you want to have in general. And then once we, because if, 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 we, if a person, I'm not saying anybody in here would, but if a person wanted to cause maximum harm, uh, our present system is nailing it. You know, if, if we don't want to have those types of relationships, then we have, we got lots of work to do. And that's what we'll get into. So uh, I worked a lot with looking at bird diversity as, uh, indicators of uh, progress. So part of this thing is we have to kind of create this map. Where are we on the map? Where do we want to get to? How do we know what we're doing is moving us in the direction we want to go or not? And so bird diversity was one of the pieces I looked at for that. Um, so we did a, a lot of work with for a while with some uh, uh, projects of mist netting and looking at, at, at uh, diversity on farm uh, ecosystems and often in wild systems. And I've also, um, I've also worked for the Forest Service here in this country mapping bird calls and, and comparing um, different habitats to, um, <clears throat> to each other. And what's interesting is that in a, uh, a lot of the diversity is really about diversity of, of habitat. And so the, the, the places that I'd go in the deep forest, in the, in the um, mature forest, had really interesting and cool species, but not more. You know, I'd hear more birds in my, from bed in the morning because my, uh, <clears throat> my house is on, uh, backed up against a north slope with a, a mixed mesophytic forest and then all my gardens and orchards and there's a stream and open areas and then a, a north slope. Uh, and all those habitats all kind of coming together. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about habitat diversity in a moment. But um, I think that it's, it's, uh, it's really useful to have, um, to, to have a mindset for what, what's happening with the birds, because they're telling us a lot about other things. Uh, people familiar with Doug Talame in, in Maryland, he did some, what I think is really brilliant observational work in looking at um, how, do, how does one nest of birds um, get fed. And he watched every, every time the, the parents came and brought food to the young hatchlings and what they brought and how many they brought. And, uh, and it was incredible numbers of caterpillars is the, is the long shot. Um, I mean, is the, the overview. And caterpillars are, are very uh, high in, in uh, food value and very low in hard to digest things, chitons, and so forth. Um, but what was interesting um, is, is you start to look at uh, how does the landscape produce enough caterpillars for that many birds. That one nest was, I can't remember the numbers, there were, it was a tremendous number for, for five birds, to raise five birds. Um, so when you start looking at how do the caterpillars uh, come about in a landscape uh, you, and the, the tree species that you have around you, um, which tree species support how many caterpillar species, for example? And the oaks are really high. They're at the top of the list. There are 540 species of caterpillars on, on an oak tree. Uh, and some of the non-native introduced plants uh, just don't have those relationships built with the insects. And so um, sometimes zero uh, for, for those. Um, and I've never been a real you know, rabid, not native, non-native plant person, but this one is, is an important thing to understand <clears throat> because what he found was that when you get 30% of your trees in your area um, being non-native, your bird population goes into a sink. That's the, that's the tipping point. Uh, and so it's not to say that you shouldn't have non-native trees, but let's look at that balance and make sure we've got all the pieces of the food chain intact. <clears throat> so we had hundreds of species down, uh, down on this uh, property. Um, 
This was a variety of cacao um, that was a wild land race going back to uh, the ancient Mayan people, uh, probably 20 some miles into the, into the forest. Um, a, it's a white, kind of a rare for that area, uh, genetics. Um, so the, the native uh, agricultural system there is, is basically uh, Sweden, or um, you know, it's it's kind of called slash and burn, you know, in in a way. And sometimes that happens, but in indigenous societies, um, it's a much more sophisticated use of fire than just usually displaced urban people that are desperate to eat, cutting randomly and burning. Um, there's a, a much longer cycle after the burning, and in general, we do have a conversation about oxidation versus photosynthesis. We're sort of mismanaging that as well. If you look at um, historically, we're oxidizing, cutting, burning, oxidizing these landscapes to where our soil organic matter is gone and, and um, in most cases, <clears throat> and the, the cover of the, the forest and vegetation. So uh, what I had begun to adapt is a 20-year uh, a rotation the forest up here, this was all a polyculture of uh, hundreds of species uh, of, of plants, a lot of chocolate and coffee and ginger and you know, uh, turmeric and vanilla and, and things like that, but also many different types of hardwoods and uh, medicinal plants. Uh, the whole property is covered in Mayan temples. There's 13 hills with Mayan temples on them, so there's this whole historic underlying aspect of it as well. Uh, so what I was working with was trying to maintain the, the, the system of food production that is traditional there, uh, which includes corn and rice and beans and squash and so forth. So every year we would cut a little piece and plant those annuals and then move on for 20 years and then come back 20 years later. And what this was doing is creating a mosaic pattern from the air of cover types and uh, led to tremendous diversity of, of birds and animals. Uh, it's a way that uh, we can easily rival the diversity in wild systems. Uh, and you see this uh, all over the tropics down into the Amazon. Um, and so this is like on a hilltop that was in annuals the previous year and now there's papayas and plantains and remnants of the previous year's things. And then, uh, then it would go back you know, further and further until it was really young forest again before it would get cut. But uh, you know, the, a lot of the insects and, um, and species thrive on those edges. That's, that's really where um, the, the higher levels of population dynamics are occurring is on the edges of these systems. Um, so we would build these uh, little shelters and then harvest the rice and corn and crops because and, these are up to a mile, <clears throat> a mile away. And in the mulch of the rice hulls from winnowing in, in that is the we planted uh, sweet potatoes here. And then these are, again, second year where the you know, plantains and chili peppers and all sorts of crops um, so I started looking at the, uh, the shade-grown aspects of this as being applicable pretty much everywhere. And in the tropics, it's really obvious. In, in, the, hot, in the hot tropical sun, in the dry season, you better have a canopy over you. You have some kind of a canopy, a thin canopy at least, um, at least for part of that year. And so uh, this kind of gets into another area that I think is um, you know, an economic observation, which is uh, I was thinking a lot about how we tend to mismanage, over-harvest, uh, and, and take too much. And so where is that line between um, what I would call principle and interest? Um, so if the, if the forest and the biodiversity and the natural capital is the principle, how do you discern what is interest in that system? In other words, what can you remove from that system with, without ever wearing it down and actually allowing it to build up. Um, and I think that when I first saw chocolate pods uh, hanging on a, on a cacao, I mean cacao pods hanging on a, on a tree under a, a canopy of, of large trees, it was like, okay, that, 
those, those cacao pods are clearly interest in the system. You know, we could take that forever, or coffee beans, or you know, ginger, and so forth. So there's a lot of uh, material that we can harvest from this, including um, wood and biomass. And I'll talk a lot more about that a little bit later for us up here, where we have a, a lot of heating and cooling and um, needs that are being met by very destructive extractive uh, fossil fuel processes. So there's a, there's a bridge uh, out there to, to get off of that. Um, uh, so you can see the corn and the, uh, the sesame, bunches of sesame seeds in that system, and there's a, a baby hanging in the shade while uh, the crew is working. Um, so, yeah, we have to shade the, we're growing some vegetable, whoops, vegetable crops here, and we're using palm leaves to shade intensive grazed beds, and you can see there's probably 50 or 60 different kinds of fruits uh, just in the, uh, five-minute walk to the, to the place where we, um, the lodge and the uh, learning center. Um, I'll keep going. So there's different ways of dealing with slopes, and, and we're experimenting with getting away from some of the burning um, by planting leguminous trees, Lucena in this case, um, on contours, just taking a machete and making a slit on the contour. Um, and planting these leguminous trees uh, in that slit, and then they'd all come up in a, in a thick wall, and then um, use that shade from that to, to grow crops in between um, in the dry season so that you're using the shade to protect it from that hot sun. And then when the first rains start, then cut the leguminous trees off about a foot high and then weave the, the tops in among the stumps and use the wood for different things and um, basically manage the sunlight and the, nit the nitrogen fixation from those trees. Um, and it, it seemed to be a, a pretty good system. The, the thing I did not see coming uh, is that um, I was constantly talking to people about how this system needs to be applied in the north in the temperate zone, and uh, the differences seem to be falling away because, you know, in the absence of soil and the presence of very hot sunlight in the dry seasons um, is kind of exactly what we're getting here now. As, our, as the intensity of our sun is increasing and our soils are down to, you know, record low organic matter, um, these agroforestry type systems are becoming non-negotiable. And, and uh, we should have been looking at them anyway, but now they're becoming more obvious, like they are in the tropics. And so we'll talk a bit about that here shortly. Um, I was really impressed with how much you could get out of a, of a landscape with a single tool, a machete. Right. So not only are they doing all these landscape level things, but then to build technology with one tool, building your other tools with it. You know, making ladders with a machete. Making, in this case, this is a sugar cane press to to press cane juice. And uh, there's probably seven different species of trees, and the. Um, you know, this is, this is a real hard, the gears here are real hardwood, hardwood of a uh, Sweetia panamensis tree, which is uh, called Billy Web, and it's also used for diabetes very effectively. Uh, so everything has tremendous numbers of uses, and um, this is a building that we built using uh, <clears throat> all local materials. The, the, the upper, up, upper level here is unchanged for really thousands of years. There's nothing, there's no nails or metal or anything in it, and all the, the types, the species of trees were really uh, key for lasting a long time and had to float them down, well, actually put them in a boat because they, some of them are so hard they sink in the, in the river. And the, uh, the vines to tie them together, again, you have to cut them in the right time of the moon. Um, because they'll last up to up to ten times longer. Not 100% sure why. Some kind of fluctuation in sugar content, most likely, and and such. But um, yeah. So the roofing is growing on trees, um, and again, making boats. Pretty much going back to to getting everything you need from a landscape, and. Um, I sometimes use the analogy that you know, here we have bank accounts and credit cards, and and down there there's the, the bank account is between your ears, and the credit card is your machete to know how to go out and get whatever you're going to get um, that you need, and literally everything is there. Uh, this is chocolate uh, after it's been um, picked 
uh, broken open, fermented, dried, roasted, and peeled. So there's, there's like 10 steps to everything you know, to get it onto a plate. Coffee, same way. Uh, okay, so jumping into another subject here. Um, this is a map of the last 800,000 years of uh, carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And there's a, only a couple of things I really want to say about this. Um, one is the last 10,000 years is this little flat spot here. And our agriculture as we know it has all occurred in that little very, very mild win window of weather. Um, so this is the CO2 up here, this is temperature, and you can see the, the matching uh, dips in ice ages and, uh, and interglacials. Peter's gonna talk, I think, more about this in his talk. Uh, I won't talk too much about it, but there's some really interesting information arising about the, the drivers of the temperature part of the story. We're seeing extreme hydrological um, weather extremes and it's being tied almost completely to CO2 um, in the news and in most information you're, you're getting. And, and in reality, the CO2 is um, driving about four to five percent of the warming part of the cycle. Um, now, it's not to say that it's not a problem at all. It's, it's, um, it's definitely driving the acidification of the oceans, which has major implications and things like that. But I think what I'm really wanting to say here is two things. One is I think we can look at, we can look at this crazy spike, which is the, you know, look at 800, 800,000 years. We're in uncharted territory here in terms of human experience of anything that we have reference for in the, in the past. Um, and uh, from an optimistic perspective, we can look at this as a feedstock to bring all that life back home, all, that, all the biodiversity, all of the, the large herds of, of animals and uh, the habitats, the soil carbon. Uh, there's place for it. There's a, it, it mostly came from there in the first place. The, this, the CO2 from fossil fuels is about... Um, the flux, yearly flux, is, is 130 billion tons of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere every year and 120 coming back down through plant uh, drawdown. Uh, 10 of the 130 is fossil fuels. I guess I feel like this is important for a number of reasons, but it, it's, it's like we're hearing if somehow we just snapped our fingers and there was no fossil fuel burning that we'd be okay. And that's not at all the case. This is very much about... Um, Surface temperatures, which is based on water dynamics uh, and um, hydration or, or dehydration. So dehydrating landscapes, uh, well, this is just showing where carbon is, um, but you can see that there's a massive bank in the soil compared to other numbers. And uh, so there's, there's plenty of room for um, the carbon in um, in places that'll serve us rather than harm us. I guess that's the message there. Um, I'm not sure people are familiar with the, with the work of uh, uh, Michael Krabchick and Walter Yenne. The New Water Paradigm book by Michael Krabchick is, uh, I think, fantastic and important. And same with uh, Walter Yenne's work. I've had the opportunity to spend um, four days this year and three days last year with him. <coughs> Um, they're, they're basically laying out the water part of this story as, as the primary drivers of, of the conditions as opposed to CO2. Um, and so in a sense, the, the primary dynamic is the sunlight hitting surfaces and whether they're vegetated or not, just to try to simplify this down, that um, unvegetated un surfaces are heating up and drying out, and vegetated surfaces are cooling off and hydrating. <laughs> so, you know, in in a, in a way, that's that's most of what you need to know about it. However, there's there's many very interesting points in terms of getting into strategy of how do we do this in the time that we have, because we're rapidly moving, as I showed you in the in the carbon dioxide slide, uh, to a place of of real threat to our food supply, and the food supply is. Um, is, exist, is an existential issue in the way that we're doing it. Now, we don't have to be relying on, on those very few 
plants, uh, annuals, um, and so forth. That's another story we'll get to. But um, this is showing that we can really change the dynamics of the heating of the planet uh, relatively quickly. And uh, I think that's, that's a, a, a really important story. So um, you can see the, the heat coming off of a drained field compared to a, a pond meadow forest landscape, uh, the, the agroforestry model I was mentioning, where uh, the sensible heat differential and the evaporation potential. So evaporation is cooling. Um, it's also, there's a number of interesting pieces of this, of, of how haze particles in the atmosphere turn into, into vapor and clouds. The dynamics of clouds versus vapors are tremendous uh, in, their, in the differences. Um, my understanding is that there's the potential for about 12 inches of rain in the Sahara, but it doesn't happen. Uh, because it's haze, which are like a millionth of a raindrop particles. Uh, the way that hazes turn into vapor in the natural world is either uh, salt crystals over the ocean and coasts or ice crystals um, high enough in, or low enough in latitude and in the upper atmosphere. Everything else is based on uh, bacterial um, nucleation, that is derived largely from trees, from the opening and closing stomata and the underside of the leaves that providing sugars and habitat and evapotranspiration, putting those into the atmosphere to aggregate those haze particles into clouds which reflect 30 to 50 percent of the, the heat dynamics compared to almost all the heat coming through those hazes and hitting the bare ground under them and heating up. So <clears throat> really the, uh, the management of, of the hydration um, is critical um, for pretty much everything that we uh, are heading toward in our goals. And the, the dynamics of floods, droughts, and fires are all completely connected. They're, they have the same root causes, and we can cut them off at the pass with proper vegetation of, of surfaces and, and some other techniques, uh, but shading these surfaces is the vast majority of that heat dynamic. Um, Kravchik is showing here that, that uh, the trends of, of ocean levels rising isn't just from, from ice melting, but it's from the draining of water from whole continents. The, the continental water, uh, the, you can go to lots of places where you had historic uh, you know, Roman uh, populations that are now dry. You can see where there were springs flowing. Uh, I believe it's, uh, what's the island? Is it it's not Mauritius? Um, Madeira. Made Madeira? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so there, they originally cut the trees and floated them down the rivers, and now there's no trees and no rivers. So you see lots of places where this dehydration has occurred and you know, it's something like some very large number, I think 40% of the, the deserts are man-made or maybe 40% of the, the landscape is desert that's man-made. But uh, the point is that these, these, uh, the dynamics of the planet are highly compromised compared to what they were say 6,000 years ago. Uh, from the Sahara to the Tibetan Plateau to uh, the Middle East, Australia, all had uh, some soil carbon sponge activity that was keeping these major extremes from, from happening. And we can learn from that and reverse it is the, the main point. So we can learn from these guys too. The, the, uh, when Europeans arrived in North America, there was somewhere between 80 million to 300 million beavers, and each one was flooding two and a half million gallons of water. Um, so there's a lot of ways to hydrate these landscapes and um, to keep our springs flowing, our rivers running, and to have the ability to uh, continue much of what we want to do. Um, we can also mimic these with uh, all sorts of um, you know, pond catchments and aquaculture systems and uh, irrigation and, and such. So. Okay, back to the, the, the soil food web is really this kind of the nexus to me of, uh, of food security and um, climate, human health, um, water dynamics. And so um, this is a, a real powerful leverage point, and I'm really appreciative that this, this 
conference is grounded in this understanding and that we have, we're building a, a common language around this and how to regenerate it. Uh, Dr. Lal is at Ohio State, which is about an hour and a half from where I live, and uh, I met with him um, not too long ago. He's, a, he's quite a, a resource on soil carbon, um, understanding soil carbon. But this is just uh, to look at some of the things that we can do to, to bring this carbon down. Again, it's not, uh, it's not the main driver, but uh, what it will do by bringing it down in terms of all the other implications is the real powerful part. And um, so that takes me to this. After my experience in the tropics, I, I became aware of these soils in the Amazon called terra preta, black earths, people familiar with them at all. Um, after watching you know, how difficult it was in trying to compost and trying to mulch and, and do all the things up here that we do to, to build organic matter and to see how uh, inevitably it oxidizes and is gone, like large compost piles re reduced to a five gallon bucket in eight months time. Um, you just can't get ahead of this, this thing. But uh, there is a civilization in the Amazon that over a period, yes? Uh, it's P R I E T A, I believe. Yeah, I mean, I've seen it spelled different. Yeah, I've seen it spelled different ways. Yeah. When I realized that this was actually a true story, I was blown out of the water. I mean, I couldn't believe it. Not only because of the difficulty of, of keeping carbon around uh, in a tropical environment, much closer to the equator than I had been working in, but uh, that there was an aggregated area the size of France. And this was 600 years after the last person did a thing to generate them. And these are man-made soils. These are uh, clearly, the, the, the soil on the left is a, uh, just the, the local Amazonian soil not interacted with, with agriculture from this, this type of method. But I, also because I couldn't really think of other um, cultural management that had such a benign effect on the future uh, 600 to, to thousands of years out. Um, so I became very interested in this and um, I think that this is one of the leverage points that we can look at that is sort of a cherry on, on top of all the other best practices of uh, top end rotational grazing management for soil building. I've seen probably the fastest carbon building short of, uh, of biochar is in grazing systems um, and uh, clearly very diverse cover cropping systems um, and, and forest management. Um, so we'll get into that. These are the points of terra preta soils. I guess they did spell it P-R-E-T-A there. Um, and so yes, aggregated the size of France. Um, there's definitely some mysteries in how what they actually did to, to generate these. But the basis of it is that the, the core of the carbon is from heat treating cellulose. Uh, basically burning wood up to the point of charcoal and not to the point of ash. Knowing when to stop is, is really critical to, to be able to maintain the, the pore structure of the xylem phloem vascular system that the plant had created to move nutrients through its body uh, and basically take off the uh, hydrogen and oxygen and leave that carbon skeleton behind in a form that is uh, hundreds of times more durable as a carbon source than um, wood or manure or mulch or any other thing you're gonna think of adding. Uh, the, the closest thing is humus. I mean, humus is, um, is, is the most durable uh, form other than that in terms of a active soil biology. So you, this isn't just wood, this is the interior of straw. Um, there's lots and lots. We just did a two day full intensive workshop on biochar and all the different uses of it and we we're running uh, farm machinery with it uh, by gasifying it. We um, making, you can cook, there's di different cookers or you can cook food with bamboo or wood or numerous things and end up with charcoal and get things done. So heating water, cooking, we're now making electricity and moving into absorption chillers and uh, pretty much you look at any function you want to that fossil fuels are doing and we can basically 
get towards that now. It's at the front end. I think probably the hardest part is transportation. Um, we can definitely do wood, wood gasification. I'm more interested in tractors for that. Anyway, long story about that. Maybe we can uh, discuss that later. I'll show you some of the um, some of the applications. I'm beta testing the first of its kind, uh, free piston Stirling engine at home. I've been living off the grid for 40 years now, and in the winter time is the bottleneck. There's not enough sun and not enough hot water from solar hot water systems, and so I'm filling that in with this very elegant uh, wood pellet, uh, wood pellet wood chip or um, nut hull um, driven um, free piston Stirling engine generator, which makes uh, 1,000 watts of electricity continuously 24 hours a day, and it creates eight and a half times that much energy in the form of hot water, which you can use for domestic hot water and space heating, and end up with charcoal. You know, so you, it's stopping the burn at the right time. So you're using pyrolysis in the absence of oxygen to, to do this. Uh, this is a very new technology, and I'm pretty excited about the next wave of it, which is even more interesting because it's way more flexible in terms of moisture. We can make these boilers going up to uh, 40 million BTUs, probably could heat this whole building, heat and cool this whole building. Uh, uses a lot of wood. There's a whole, whole conversation about where, how are we going to sustainably produce that cellulose and have a lot to say about that. So this is just a, a statement about natural capital, which I think is, is this flywheel that bio, if you watch biological systems over long periods of time, you see them increasing this, in this natural capital. And that allows for resilience, and that's just what it does in between disturbances. And disturbances aren't bad. <laughs> you know, a lot of times they're very much adapted to. In the western states, the adaptation to fire not the frequent fires we're seeing. We're, we're, they're really being stretched to their limits now because the fires are, they don't have time to regenerate in between fires. But uh, there's a lot of, there's a whole conversation about uh, disturbance and planning for disturbance in the ecosystem models that we're designing for. Uh, I'll give you a quick example of, of a disturbance pattern my, uh, that's a little odd, but uh, my father was having heart attacks uh, when he was told it was heartburn. He's having these small heart attacks that the doctors did not uh, understand. <clears throat> and each of those small heart attacks were constricting his major arteries and it was stimulating this capillary growth bypass system. And he had a number of them and um, he eventually had a heart attack that certainly would have killed him but he survived for 45 more years because those, that capillary system that was built as a result of these disturbance, uh, small heart attacks. Um, so you can look at disturbance in a lot of ways, and, and, and they, they actually kind of hone the strength and, and adaptability of systems over time. Um, and we can plan for them, but the, uh, there's a lot of new disturbances that, that systems that we are working with um, have not had time to adapt to. Um, anyway, there's a whole ecological discussion about disturbances and, and what we can derive from that. Um, really, the way we're, we're harvesting and interacting with our agroecosystems are disturbances, and we can do that in a way that enhances the strength of them over time. Uh, that last statement was, was the World Bank, which is a, I thought was odd, but uh, these are kind of, to me, obvious observations that we need to incorporate into our currency value to, to link currency value to this natural capital. If not, it's, it's completely insane, uh, just to, to put it lightly, because, um, you know, for example, you can have a, an increase in GDP from an increase in cancer cases, you know, it's because it makes money in hospitals. I mean, that's, that's not a, um, it's not a sign of improvement. Uh, I think that, you know, what Krishnamurti said, that is, is no sign of health to be well adapted to a profoundly sick society. And I think that's, an, that's kind of an example of that. Um, so this is this flywheel I was talking about. You know, nature goes from, whoops, uh, from bare rock through these different stages. And each time it's building soil, it's building uh, tough species that can create shade and hold a little moisture and make space for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And we can really learn from this process um, and model our uh, agriculture and our other management systems 
based on what these biological systems uh, accumulate and what, that, uh, what resilience that allows them to have. Some of the things we can do here to improve the resilience and hydration of landscapes um, is forest, far forest farming, silvopasture, alley cropping, or agroforestry. It comes in a lot of different flavors and styles. Uh, riparian um, management and, um, and windbreaks. Um, this is the bump that I was mentioning at the edges. Uh, uh, you know, we can design uh, openings and systems to have to maximize those edges and have water and different, uh, you know, forest and field and different cover types to where we, we're getting these bumps and the and the. Um, there's a lot of design uh, dynamics that we can get into to maximize those transition zones and the increase of species in them. Mentioned the uh, agroforestry. I'm going to go through these a little bit quick. Um, yeah, so dealing with slopes, I mentioned that in the tropical um, slides. Um, there's a lot of ways to do this, and, and we'll, uh, we'll see some uh, silvopasture. So are people familiar with Steve Gabriel's work in, at Cornell? Um, I have seen such impressive um, results from proper rotational grazing. And if you layer on top of that uh, tree plantings that create shade in those really hot dry cycles that turn the pastures brown, you can keep grazing uh, environments going uh, right through that, that system. Plus, there's a lot of species of trees that are producing um, really high value fodder. And you can do things like pollarding where you're cutting the trees above the animal uh, reach and then keep managing those, uh, the shade from those by cutting them and letting the animals eat the, the fodder off of the, the branches then collecting those branches and making biochar and other things. Uh, or ramial chips and um, mulches and mushroom uh, growing. So I think that we can really uh, change the dynamics uh, of landscapes with this, especially if we were to, say, pull out all of the grain feeding to, <clears throat> to cows in this case. There's no reason to do that. And you look at the amount of, when you drive across the country, how much of the landscape is dominated by uh, annual monocultures. I inspect organic farms all across the country, and I get to see all this stuff uh, up close and personal. I, I'm working with the functional end of it, but I see the rest of it, all the uncover cropped ground out there. And, um, and how much is being grown for feed, which is unnecessary, because you're just going to make those animals sick. I've seen it over and over again. Uh, it's a direct proportional. If, if you look at farms and the animal health, it's directly proportional to how much the animals are on pasture. So the more you keep them indoors and feed them grain, the more you're going to have veterinary bills and, and have sick animals and have short lifespans. It's clear as a bell. Uh, but we, f we tend to economically want to force the landscape to do what we want it to do rather than what it can do at great cost to uh, the suffering of the animals and, and the soil and, and the whole thing. So there's a way to do this right, and this is really moving in the right direction. This can be integrated with other, other things, other species, and uh, you know, other plantings of, of uh, edible and um, energy and oil trees, things like that. So I've been on the uh, advisory board for about 25 years of United Plant Savers, which is a, a medicinal plant um, conservation group, and have been working with non-timber forest products and medicinal plants and herbalists for, for quite some time. And this is another area of real potential to develop because what we're seeing with particularly um, younger to medium growth forests, that the density of wood is really thick and it's in danger of burning uh, in, a dry, in a really dry cycle. So, and not only that, but the, the density of trees is so thick that they're competing with each other so much that they're not producing nuts very well, they're not producing habitat very well. Again, the native peoples were doing brilliant uh, sequential quick burns often to manage a more open understory 
um, that was higher in nut production of all the animals that, that ate the nuts, but also open enough to let grasses and forbs come in so that the ungulate populations, the elk and deer, and those species to be optimized. And then they were managing for their basket plants and their tubers and, and numerous other ecological outcomes. Um, so one of the things I'm seeing is that you know, there's an opportunity now that we have uh, more of a problem with carbon in the atmosphere um, and way more people than there ever were before that need work, uh, an opportunity to harvest a lot of that wood directly and, and get the whole range of, of timber type products, but also um, the feedstocks for growing mushrooms, ramial chips, making biochar, and we'll get into the economy that we can run from that cellulose if we are realistically going to jump off of the fossil fuel wagon. So the thing that's amazing is that if you, if you do that work and you get all those functions done, you're left with this nice open understory situation to be able to grow, in this case, golden seal. Um, I've been just beginning to work with um, a certification process other than organic that's forest grown certification for ginseng. Uh, and golden seal, and, and it'll be a number of different species, but it's beginning with ginseng, because what's happened historically with ginseng is the population has just methodically been annihilated, uh, and it's, it's gotten fairly critical. I was at a uh, conference in, in West Virginia a couple years ago where it was a very fascinating group of people because it was um, everything from uh, law enforcement to the uh, kind of redneck diggers, uh, the illegal diggers, and the researchers and the, the growers all in the same room. And everybody was agreeing that we want ginseng in the future, and we all are agreeing, looking at the numbers, that we're losing it. And so this is what I was meaning in the beginning when I said that, that, there's, uh, that we really need to look at the supply chains of everything that we care about and make sure they're, they're you know, being maintained properly. They were not wearing them down. So uh, companies like Gaia Herbs and Mountain Rose Herbs are uh, working with this, this process of, of third-party certification. And so the first ones I did, we'd go out and, and map the population and look at what was going to be harvested that year, the time of year it's going to be harvested, when uh, in relation to the, the berries and the seeds and, and how to uh, plant those seeds back so that the population it was going to be bigger the next year than it is this year. So just to guarantee that this is a regenerating supply chain. And what's interesting uh, also about it is that it, it really begins to describe a lot of other shrinking supply chains, the fisheries, um, forestry jobs in the Northwest, and, and so forth. And so this is just a matter of having a longer-term view of what we're doing and caring about how things come into existence and uh, to see them be increasing over time. So it's uh, fascinating uh, for people who don't know what ginseng looks like. This is what it, what it is. And so uh, the, the berries are just starting to ripen here. But if you um, pick, them, pick the berries when they're ripe and then distribute them around in the same area, in this slide, you can see golden seal as well, and bloodroot. Uh, this is bloodroot and golden seal. These are fantastic medicinal plants. We're blessed with them, and in, in, in where I live is uh, sort of ground zero for, for that. We have a phenomenal plant sanctuary with acres and acres of these things. Um, it can be pretty close. It can be uh, within a, a, it could be at the same time or, or not too far after for harvest. Um, there's some fascinating chemistry going on here, and uh, you know we've been seeing. I've been uh, running a BFA chapter in Ohio, uh, the only one in Ohio for about six years now, six seven years, and we're seeing huge changes in the food plants um, with some of the volcanic minerals and mineral balancing and biological um, additions. And I have a. Uh, well, what I mean by that is a combination, without getting into the, the bionutrient meter yet or the high-tech systems, we're seeing um, real changes in insect and disease resistance, in flavor, in pigmentation, colors, uh, and shelf life. And those are going to be 
pretty solid, I think, in, 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 in telling us that we're headed in the right direction. We're very interested and will be using these other monitoring tools, and uh, they're important. But I, have a, uh, I started a project on the plant sanctuary in Meigs County in Ohio, um, and to see what, what happens with some of these same techniques with medicinal plants in the forest with really very little input, but start to see if does the, does the chemistry start changing uh, in similar ways. You know, we've been seeing you know, hundreds of times some of the polyphenols and antioxidants in foods um, recently in manage, with, with these types of management systems. But um, we have a grant proposal to, um, to look at, ginseng's a little too complicated. There's 20 ginsenicides that are fluctuating in numbers and types, and to, so to try to track that out is just a little bit too much for me right now. But the, uh, the golden seal is a little more, there's two alkaloids primarily that, that we're looking at there, and they can be measured reasonably easily. So what I'm proposing to do is to take uh, 10 or 20 pounds of roots and, and cut them down into uniform pieces and plant beds and have some that are just forest, that particular forest soil, um, and then another one with some foliar sprays of volcanic minerals and biology, and then three years later, dig them up, weigh them, uh, test the chemistry before, test it afterwards, and just see what we get. It's just a, it's an interesting whole territory we don't tend to think too much about. It's people just think, well, it just grows wild, we're going to just think about it that way, but there's some um, hybrid zones that we can begin looking at. I just visited a guy in North Carolina um, that blew my mind. You probably know Joe Hollis, uh, Pete. Peter, yeah, um, but he's he's really bending the. So he is bl is blurring some of the lines between. Um, well, he isn't, but he's using a lot of plants in a way that um, starts to blur the lines between medicine and food. You know, we're already seeing this with uh, with, with really healthy food and the reversal of, of a lot of uh, inflammatory conditions and and other modern um, diseases. Uh, with food, but um, you know, he, for example, he's got a plant. Um, I think it's called Zhao Gulin. It's a perennial uh, cucurbit that has, interestingly enough, it's not even closely botanically related, but it has five leaflets and it tastes like ginseng. It has some of the same ginsenicides in it, and it's an edible. So here we have this nutraceutical plant that can take the pressure off of a of a semi-endangered plant that grows perennially in shaded woody areas. And uh, so in the, the territory here, once we jump out of these very small number of plants that we, we are depending on, um, is phenomenal. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So we, I grow a lot of mushrooms, and uh, th this is also a very powerful uh, series of medicines and um, economic products that can be derived from landscapes that we previously were seeing as uh, pretty much solely economically board feet of lumber. You know, we're moving from board feet of lumber to a huge array of foods and medicines and um, products that can come out of these landscapes and take a lot of the pressure off of these dominated landscapes for annual agriculture. Uh, we can be deriving huge numbers of things, including biological um, resources from these, you know, in the Korean natural farming type systems, deriving those biologicals for our agricultural sector. Um, so seeing a continuum between forests and, and uh, open agricultural lands, um, I guess, is the point. But these are all very powerful with um, immune enhancing, uh, uh, cancer reversing, and, and many other uh, adaptogenic qualities. Well, we're going to find that out. <laughs> We've got a lot of processes in plants. Uh, yeah, the question to, to summarize that is when you're, you're saying when you put uh, medicinal plants in, or edible plants in, poly, in polyphenols, when you go from a, a, a good biological soil to a poor soil. So if it's a plant that's adapted to shade, um, I would presume that it's still going to be the question in place is, is really, you know, in that forested landscape, there's likely to be more mycorrhizal fungi. And, and even if there's not a lot of carbon visible, good looking soil, if that plant is colonized by a mycorrhizal fungi in that landscape because it wasn't tilled so much and it wasn't managed, like we're saying, um, then it's still pretty likely that that plant could be 
pretty significant in polyphenols because it has access to the A, B, and C horizons through that mycorrhizal association. But we are going to be looking at a lot of these conditions with crop by crop with the bionutrient meter and uh, in different kinds of settings to see some of these things. We got more questions than answers right now on that. Um, but presumably, you'd, be, you'd have more fungi. Uh, in general, the forests have, are much more fungi than agricultural right. landscapes. And balancing bacteria and, uh, and uh, fungi is a real big piece of, of what we need to do. Yes, and that is a really interesting territory. If you look at uh, Christine Jones' work in Australia, um, you know, some things like chemicals and compaction are really uh, negative. Uh, tillage is generally demonized, uh, but there's a, a, there are situations with small amounts of tillage that um, I think are not as deadly to fungi as is often talked about, if that's what you're getting at, with, with inoculants and particularly turning under, like what I see after... Um, turning under a, a 10 species mix of cover crops with uh, some, some woody material in there like sun hemp that gets 12 feet tall. Um, you're seeing a lot of fungal activity in that soil uh, after turning that in. Uh, not necessarily mycorrhizal. So we're getting into a very complex zone here, but I think that um, you know, when, when I asked Walter Yenne about this, this bionutrient meter, I, I was fascinated by his response because he said, um, well, why not just skip to the chase and, 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 and pull the plant up and, and test uh, and, and basically look at the root zone to see and look for metabolites that are associated to mycorrhizal fungi? Because if your crop is, is colonized by mycorrhizal fungi, it's connected. It's hooked in. We'll, we'll see this here in a minute in some uh, other slides. But we can get back to that in a moment. I, I don't have a complete answer for you, but I could have predictions. There are projects in place to get that information out. And I think that in the next few years, we'll be able to answer that better. Whole complex zone of these, uh, the liquid carbon pathway in the soil, the exudates from plants. Uh, when plants are healthy, their, their percentage of their photosynthetic energy uh, is radically increased over a plant that's struggling for survival. I've been thinking a lot lately about this in terms of the analogy to people. Um, there's a, in, in, in a plant and the soil, there's a bi-directional flow. Um, and it is um, such that when the plant gets what it needs and it's communicating with, with the soil microbes, it's giving sugars and other compounds, upcycling uh, pathogens and or up, down, down cycling pathogens and upcycling uh, nutrients and other things. But when the plant is optimized, getting close to being optimized, the amount of, of carbon being secreted into the soil is, is really significant. Um, I didn't understand this for a long time. I thought that the carbon sequestration of a plant was the total of its roots and its above ground mass, but there can be you know 40% more into the soil. And so this is a, a really big piece of, of soil building, um, and we just really need to figure out how to do this. It's, it seems to be happening with these cover crops. Uh, uh, there was a study in Germany, I believe it was, that um, was looking at cover crops, single species, two, three, all the way up to 16. And in a drought uh, environment, um, it, the drought was bad enough to where everything died except for the plots with eight species and more. So it seems to be indicating to me that, <clears throat> that the diversity of exudates in multiple species of plants um, is diverse enough to feed a, a more diverse um, uh, population of microbial activity, which creates more resilience. Uh, there's also some uh, hydrophilic uh, sugar dynamics and things like that from the sugars that are being exuded. Um, but um, resilience in general from uh, healthy plants. But a fascinating topic in terms of looking at the communication that's going on um, between the plants and the microbes and the fungi. A plant, this is what I was saying before. If a plant is connected with mycorrhizal fungi on the right, it is in communication and accessing moisture and nutrients of all types and uh, say a uh, water-soluble NPK fertilizer application that knocks that out 
uh, glyphosate, et cetera. Uh, and you've got a plant that is just uh, totally dependent and um, you know, it all, it's like a begging for, for you know, handouts from the farmer who generally is only using a very few uh, minerals out of you know, at least 50 or so that is needed for the full, um, the full set of needs. Otherwise, you're kind of mining that soil, which is really what we've been doing. Um, anyway, this is sort of the final frontier in a way for uh, annual agriculture uh, to try to achieve because uh, the, the mycorrhizae are um, more often than not highly compromised. So back to the water management and soil. Um, in some of the arid areas like Australia, um, techniques are developing for more rapid um, development of soils into the zone between the topsoil and the subsoil and getting microbial life and oxygen and water infiltrated into that. Um, it's not the only way to do this. I mean, depending on slope and soil type and numerous factors, um, we can open these soils up with you know, different uh, plant mixes. But in some cases, um, this is a fairly rapid way to hydrate landscapes and, and make massive progress. And the idea here is to move water from the um, places where it's going to run off to the dry uh, ridges. So, so water is going to normally just run right down here, right? Instead, catching it up as high as possible and running them out to these dry ridges with swales and tree plantings, um, it's fairly costly. There's a lot of energy input and a lot of, a lot of cost and, and time in this, but you can get dramatic results. And so it's, it's one, of the, one of the tools in our, in our tool belt for restoring landscapes to high level of function. Um, here's Mark Shepard will be talking about this if you want to go into a little more detail, I believe. Uh, so the idea here is to, uh, is to go just into your, slightly into your subsoil um, initially and you know, dig, the, dig your uh, profile and look at where the topsoil goes to subsoil and just get an inch of colonization of new microbes and moisture and um, uh, temperature in the spring down there to where you're, you're growing zones and then going deeper you know, each year. Uh, I've heard some pretty pretty astounding um, changes in, in topsoil depth in, in as little as five years. So also cat catching water at high points in the landscape and, um, and releasing it in the drier cycles to try to, uh, really a lot of this conversation is really about locating limiting factors, whether you're looking at nutrients in the, uh, the soil or you're looking at, you know, obviously water, air, uh, those kinds of things, but also, you know, um, nutrients in the body for, for uh, the human system. And so locating the limiting factors and uh, trying to, to get them achieved with the least amount of energy and time possible. Um, so this landscape is gonna be cooler. I gave a talk at the uh, Summit County uh, water, Soil and Water Conservation District this past spring and everybody was drowning in all this rain. You know, as they're underwater, the farmers are on their last year for being able to, to, to do this. If they have one more wet year, that's, it's over kind of thing. That's what they were telling me. And I'm basically telling them we need to infiltrate that water. Uh, and it's uh, like the last thing they, it, it's counterintuitive. Uh, they want to drain it off and get rid of it, but because of the draining of so many landscapes, we have these imbalances. And so we're getting these warmer, drier landscapes which have um, high pressure systems and the moisture is moving from those to the low pressure systems which are already green and don't really need as much water and then all that water is getting dumped all at once on the on the low pressure areas so this is um, there's a lot to turn around here the, the, things are way out of balance uh, so you kind of have to design systems to be able to take high water events and and drought in the same year this is what we found this year I mean there were pretty large areas that I saw crop failures um, you know, good driving all the way to Colorado, um, pretty stunning. I, I, I've done this a lot and I haven't seen, uh, it's definitely getting more extreme, put it that way. So this is an area, I believe it's in Chiapas or, or so, but uh, in terms of distributing, a, a lot of what I've been moving toward is a decentralization of production and uh, on 
as close to on-site use as possible. There's a massive footprint of energy um, being lost from just moving food around. It could be the best food in the world, but if it's moving you know, 1,300 miles on average, which is what uh, I believe our food is moving, uh, you've got that whole energy footprint of moving it. You've got the loss of nutrients on route. You've got the packaging and, and so on and so forth. And so by removing all of that unnecessary footprint by diversifying landscapes where people live and storing the food and the energy and the water, everything they need right where they are, uh, you're completely transforming the, uh, most of the negative Im impacts that we're seeing. So these ravines are full of these food, food forests and then you've got your agriculture, just like we were, I was showing with the, with the rotations, but in some slopes you can't just randomly rotate. You've got to you know, deal with your annuals on, on, on slopes, and, I mean on uh, terraces and, and such. But, um, so let's see, I don't know. I think this could be a place to stop. You were saying one minute, okay. Why don't we take, uh, what, what are we doing for a break? 10, 15 minutes? Half hour? Okay, whatever. I'll... <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh, pick up when we get back then. So getting back to uh, where we left off, um, distributed uh, production and home scale management has got uh, a huge potential in um, reducing it, th these negative impacts that we're, we're trying to speak to. So distributed production is one thing but then it's capturing the excess when you have it. There's, uh, the way things generally work is that you get these huge amounts of energy and food and water all at once and we need to figure out ways to capture them. We talked about the wetlands and the ponds and the cisterns and all those kind of systems of catching water, um, which are, are really important. The home scale storage of food and um, energy is, is also playing into this, I think, very powerfully. One of the things that seems to be happening is more and more crop failures, so we're going to need to get through longer periods of time in between, so that points to storage. Uh, I've been looking at a lot of... Uh, <clears throat> I work a lot with the Amish and, uh, in, in these farming communities, and I'm driving long distances through landscapes that are uh, really running on present sunlight, uh, including the feed for their animals and, and such. And looking at uh, some of the ice house technologies, uh, I, I was at a, uh, a cooperative vegetable producer group in Pennsylvania uh, a while back, and they've got a warehouse that's probably eight times the size of this room uh, in vegetables that are running completely off of ice from a pond that's right out behind the building. Uh, and they got a, a, a ramp that goes to the pond and they go out and they, like, they, run a, they rent a circular saw for one day and they'll go out and, and cut the ice and run it up the ramp and store it in this, a room about this big for ice. And it's, it's such simple technology. I mean, they have a sliding door and a thermometer on the wall. And if the thermometer is looking like a little bit warm, they just open the door to the ice room a little bit and vice versa if it's getting too cool. And in, uh, I was really impressed because in, in late May, the potatoes didn't even begin to sprout. They were in perfect condition. And we're talking about a really large warehouse full of food. Um, and it was being used for a number of producers uh, cooperatively. So uh, I think we're going to have to get through longer periods of time um, with, uh, with what we have. Not only that, but you know, when I, you know, we, I live in a county in Ohio that's kind of the mecca for local food and alternative things, and yet when, a, when the weather comes on, there's a big storm coming in, um, even in a place like that, uh, the stores are stripped bare of food on the shelves in one day. Um, everybody is running around, and you know, then you have, you know, if, if you have the storm and the grid goes down, um, your, your time is really ticking. Um, you've got a few days for things like food, and then you get the first you know, fist fights at the gas station after three or four days, and uh, it, it, things start breaking down pretty quickly. Um, it's unnecessary. So you don't, you don't see this running around in cars to try to get things every couple days in packages um, and, and going back and forth. That whole footprint is unnecessary if you've got months of storage in every home which is really no reason not to.
Yeah, we could go through this whole system and look at where the waste is. I, I was mentioning about the uh, annual production of, uh, of crops for livestock that are not designed to eat those. Uh, you take that away and it liberates this huge landscape for that. Um, I think the upshot is going to be whether we do this voluntarily or not, the energy to, to have all this wasted uh, time and energy in the system is going to be gone in a snap of a finger at some point, and then what do we, you know, why do we, why do we not prepare? It's, it's an odd thing to me that uh, in Boy Scouts, being prepared is a good thing, and, uh, but for an adult in our society, you, know, you get called a prepper or something, you're like you're, you're paranoid if you're, if you're you know, prepared. Um, and so I think that there's a, a lot of uh, territory to explore here just for resilience and, and um, you know, the, for the well-being of our, our families and communities. Um, so in this biological um, management of, you know, we tend to talk about our farms and our gardens and things like that, but we don't necessarily think about them in terms of the larger uh, biological flows and the uh, the... This is a series of biological corridors um, it, that are linking protected areas. And um, so it, it's helpful in your backyard if you know that you're on a, a hummingbird um, nectar flyway on their way to the tropics that you can plant plants in your backyard to assist in that. Uh, this is, uh, what's the little country uh, in uh, the Himalayas? Bhutan. So they've got the uh, gross national happiness, you know, model and so forth, and they've got uh, quite an impressive, uh, this kind of fits with that kind of thinking a lot. How do you get that? Well, there's a, um, not easy, uh, but there's a man in the biosphere program. They have a system of bio, uh, biosphere reserves, and part of the logic of that system is to link the core, there's core protected areas, and then there's, uh, biological corridors and there's uh, zones of, of human management and the the kind of agroforestry I was mentioning earlier fits really nicely between the protected areas and the more intensive management of agriculture or uh, urbanization or say say and, oh uh, I would look at man in the biosphere program you uh, at UNEP man and the biosphere program um, John may have some resources on that, possibly. Any other resources than uh, UNEP, Man in the Biosphere Program, on... I was looking at it because I didn't see too many management systems that were really linking human communities in with, with wilder protected areas, and especially that transition zone between the two and the biological corridors that link, link them, particularly for large uh, predators and things like that that need to interbreed because otherwise you cut them off in these pockets and then they, uh, you know, they, they degenerate. So it's, it's really important for some of these larger species that require large habitats that can get boxed in by a, a, a well-meaning preserve that isn't linked um, to the flows of migration and uh, interbreeding and things like that. So I just thought I would mention that about uh, biological corridors. We can think about these in smaller scales within farms that might uh, link their woodlands through biological corridors from one piece of woods to another. Um, and things like that. So it's not just massive, you know, national scale. Yeah, these mosaic wild areas we can um, we can learn a lot from. Whoops. Um, but yeah, this is just a good example of a, a well hydrated landscape in a in an area that's generally heating up and drying out. People familiar with biomimicry? I just threw a couple examples of this in here. Um, this is just really looking at a, a, a Japanese train design based on the uh, the beak of a kingfisher and uh, increase, you know, allowing it to be quieter, 10% faster, and 15% more energy efficient. Similar example of uh, passive cooling in buildings from termite uh, design. These are just some shots. I guess I didn't really say that uh, I live in a uh, uh, community land trust model. I think when we really get into a lot of these techniques, what I seem to find as limiting factors is uh, what I find primarily is access to freedom. And what I mean by that is uh, economic pressures, debt. Um, these are all, a lot of the farmers I work with, they know better than what they're doing. They find that they can't do them because they can't afford to do them. They can't uh, get the loan that they need if they do what they really want to do or they just 
don't have access to, to the, the, uh, the time and the money and the resources to do uh, a better ecological job of management. What I've been seeing in traveling around, particularly with the, with the uh, indigenous uh, people in Central America and the Amish, is they've got very well-developed cooperative structures in place for exchanging labor without money. And um, like, say, those, those uh, thatched roofs I was talking about, uh, 20, 25 people come together and help someone uh, build a roof or uh, plant their rice field, and then that person owes each of those 20 people a day for whatever they want to do. And you see this similarly in the, uh, in the Amish communities and, and swapping and trading and, and just uh, generally not needing as much stuff. Everybody doesn't have to buy their own things. And so uh, back in the early 80s, a number of us... Um, came together with very little resources and realized we needed to have access to land to be, uh, to basically have freedom, you know, and, and uh, we set up a system of uh, fairly simple, I mean, it's, and in some ways it's not much more different than, a, than some of these housing developments and condominiums. It's just a, a common area that's, that's commonly owned, and then um, what we did is, is created five acre leaseholds within a 240 acre property that are for personal homesteads. So we've got lots of privacy, personal homesteads, but within this larger shared context. And the economics of that is tremendous. And I think it's very relevant for young people today, more than it was for us uh, in terms of affording land. Um, 10 people were able to get the bank and the corporations out of our lives in five years. Uh, whereas if we each would have bought our own property and our own tractors and built our own ponds and our own fencing and a lot of the commons expenses, um, we would have never got out of debt. I never would have traveled to Central America or, or done anything I've done in my life. But, I mean, I also was pretty hardcore. I, I moved into the forest in, in a small shack in the woods for 10 years without running water and uh, a telephone or electricity. In the years that I was paying off that land, so once I, I was paying off the land before I got into building infrastructure and things that I could live without at, at that time in my life pretty easily and happily, actually, um, and I was also putting in my wells and cisterns and spring developments and planting nut trees, the, kind of the long-term decisions that can happen while you're waiting for, for all the others. And once I had the land paid off and those things in place, then I began building uh, a, a longer-term home and putting in, I went through three iterations of solar electrical systems, you know, from extremely small to medium to what to me is large, but still probably not that big for most people's needs. Uh, it's a lot more than I know what to do with almost. So this is just a view out of my front yard, vegetables. And so house is nestled in up here. We try not to build in open areas. We build on edges and, uh, and pretty remote from each other for the most part. And this is just the larger part of my personal garden. We also have uh, a community uh, scale staple crop growing system for the people who want to work. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's berries and fruit, uh, uh, buckwheat and cover crops and other, other crops here among, uh, you know, then blueberries. And there's a stream here. I was mentioning about the, the uh, south facing slope and the north facing slope and a stream. And so it's just uh, incredible for bird species there. I mean, it's as good as anywhere I've been around. This is the five acre leasehold. It goes back into the woods. We've got hollows and, and springs and medicinal plants and things on the five acres. That's embedded in a 240 acre uh, community of 10, roughly 10 households. There's a little bit more than that. We have some rentals. Um, but um, just to talk about the access to land here in ways that might not be possible economically uh, within the time um, that you've got to wait. So these are you know, beehives, and this is a little catchment pond that I run springs from the other side of the hollow uh, up till about June or July. I've got water flowing constantly into that, yeah. I did for many years, I did farmer's markets and contract grew vegetables for baby food companies, organic baby food, and then I watched a truckload of uh, about 10,000 pounds of winter squash 
driving down the road that they picked up from our farm to take to a baby food company and I'm thinking, hmm, that's, that's mostly water and that's diesel fuel driving it around. I could get that whole truckload into a box this big in the form of seeds and I started growing seeds for seed companies, uh, seeds of change and abundant life seeds and, and such. Uh, and then got more into educational programs to grow seed growers <laughs> and, and so forth. So keep going down that road. So at this point, all of us have done uh, the agricultural shuffle and, uh, you know, in our group, and we all have other skills that we can make money much more efficiently. So we still grow. We have an agricultural system, but it's all for on our own use. We, we do barter and trade and in the larger community, but it's, there's not really a, a money focus. It's uh, unfortunately a, a rigged game. It was always... It was always a slap in the face at the end of the year after all that work. Here's the check. Gosh, I, would, I think I'd feel better of giving it away than, than going through that. So, uh, so no, not right now. Um, yeah, anyway, this little pond is a rubber, uh, roofing rubber lined pond, about 18,000 gallons. And I can run water into it from the gutters, from the springs that are flowing on the other side. When those dry up, I've got, uh, I've got a... a, a pump in the well and I've got a pump in the stream so it, wherever the water is and the, the, the one nice thing about droughts is that you've got a lot of sunlight and you've got plenty of power to pump water uh, at, at that point so um, this is able to that, that little pond right there is a catchment that I can use to keep filling and then watering that whole valley of about uh, one and a half to two acres um, and then so these are solar thermal pad panels. I've got a solar hot water system in the back and, and photovoltaics on the roof. Um, so the, uh, we did, we've done a lot of work with seeds and, and looking at you know, genetic diversity within uh, our crop plants. So I tend to look at uh, intraspecies diversity or the genetic information diversity within a species, the interspecies diversity of the totality of speciation in a landscape, and the, uh, the habitat diversity within that landscape as being useful ways of thinking about diversity. Then you've got social components uh, of diversity as well. Um, but this variety was a uh, calico popcorn. It's a very old popcorn, and it, it, in the genetics in the field, it, it reverted to a uh, podcorn, um, would you call it a, a grandfather, corn. grandfather corn, in which each of the kernels is, is wrapped separately. It it's really goes back to the earliest types of corns. Um, very interesting, but the point is I was, I was looking at one of these corns one year, um, I think it was in an Acres conference, and um, I think I was just staring at it and, and getting the information through osmosis or something, but uh, this little hand came around my shoulder and started pointing to each one and naming every, every color and every one with, you know, streaks on it and, you know, Hopi ceremonial corns and um, Zuni such and such and so on. And, and I started to realize that, gosh, if you, you lost, uh, it, well, we have lost a lot of named varieties, tremendous amount. In USDA records alone, I think it was um, between 1804 and 1904 that pretty much 90% of all food crop plants were gone. Um, you know, that, that doesn't say that we lost the genes. It says we lost the varieties. And so the genetic information in a, in a variety like this, um, and Chris has got an amazing story I should have you mentioned because he, uh, he's got this uh, black Peruvian corn and out of seemingly nowhere about eight different colors and, and five, at least five different types of corn just emerged out of that and I, I have no idea how to explain that but the idea is that these older varieties contain a lot of what we need to select back out from you know, you, if you'd wanted to take the time, you had a few bushels of this corn, you could pick out all those different colors and separate them into their own um, piles and, and rebreed them and select them for things that we need, not that the industry needs. So bushels per acre isn't particularly interesting unless it's connected to nutrition per acre. Um, and we, we have all this work to do in each of our localized regions of adapting these plants to the conditions that we have, the, the pathogen pressures, the, climbing, uh, the climate 
that's changing in all different ways, uh, wet years, dry years, and you know, a lot of the, the Mexican farmers would plant 40 different kinds of beans in a field because they knew anything could happen. And so if it was a dry year, these beans would do better, a wet year, these beans would do better. So we really need to diversify uh, our food supply. I mean, it's not just within you know, these handful of annual crops that the world is overemphasizing. Uh, there were, there were 20,000 plant species that were used for food historically, and uh, we've shrunk this down to a very small number. Uh, what, 12, I think, is making up probably 90 or 90, yeah, about 90 percent of the food supply. Um, we need, this is, this is just showing a map of where our food plants that we do use come from. They're not evenly distributed. There's uh, hot spots. Uh, the Russian scientist uh, in Vavilov began locating these centers of diversity and, and uh, collected all these collections. And um, there's an amazing book called um, Shattering by Carrie Fowler and Pat Mooney that if anybody hasn't uh, read, I would... Uh, suggest, because it, it, it talks about Vavilov's work and the centers of diversity and what happened to him uh, in Russia, but the, the scientists that he trained in these, these grow-out centers that have all, all of his collections, they actually uh, raises the hair on your, on your arms, but um, they decided uh, to, they had to choose in the, in the siege of Leningrad whether to eat the seed uh, collection or to starve, and they chose to starve. They understood the value of that genetic information uh, to the rest of the world was more important than themselves, which is kind of getting seed diversity at a level that I think most people would have to really think about. But um, there's a, a lot of reason to diversify our, our relationship to everything, as we've been talking about, but within these um, seed crops, there is a, a really wide range of, uh, you know, you have to put on some special genetic glasses to see into the hollowness of, of what you see driving across the country in corn and soybeans, for example, uh, that there's nothing there that you can even use, you know, it'll revert immediately back to something else, it won't even uh, breed true. And then it's either genetically engineered or, or you know, tied to some group of chemicals for its survival. Um, we need to think very differently about the long run and the implications of, say, what happened in the, uh, the Irish potato famine of you know, the incredible diversity of potatoes in the Andes uh, and the you know, overemphasizing of two varieties of potatoes, one of which made up 75% of all the potatoes in Ireland at the time of the, uh, the blight. And, you know, that's a predictable event to narrow yourself down like that. Something is going to happen. You need building blocks to breed around whatever changes happen, and there just wasn't. I mean, that's, that's half of the story. The other half is kind of a political story of, of you know, the food that was being grown was being exported to England in form of taxes, and that's, that's a whole other thing that has nothing to do with ge genetics, I don't think. But... Um, Anyway, this is just showing that our, our seeds come from specific places and they're really important to uh, protect. So, you know, one of the things about like where corn comes from in Mexico, um, you know, these genetically engineered varieties are getting in there and crossbreeding into these places that are um, really dangerous, uh, dangerously messing with the kind of the, the Fort Knox of our genetic uh, food supplies. Uh, we, can, we can radically diversify the plants that we use for food and not be so dependent on them, but if we care about something, we better um, look at, at, at taking care of the, the base of that genetic system. This is an unusual uh, system of mapping the, the planetary botanical diversity, um, generally for using for um, collections and things. Um, it's a Dahlgren system of taxonomy that's different. It's an isoproportional bubble map. Um, this is coming out of the work of um, Alan Kapular, um, who, I don't know if he still has it, but he had a, a seed company called Peace Seeds and, and uh, Peace Seeds uh, Research Journal. Uh, some really fantastic um, deep end management of genetic diversity. Uh, but what he was basically looking at here is uh, the sizes of these uh, circles are the number of species in those groupings. They're superorders, 
and um, the, the proximity of the circles that are next to them is the, is the relational, um, evolutionary relational diversity. And so what they were doing was looking at regional collections. You could look at uh, a, a local collection and then just distribute them into those circles and see how much, what kind of representation we have of the whole system. And uh, that allows you to kind of see maybe we're overemphasizing, you know, Solanaceae or um, some other group of plants, and we can branch out and diversify that. And there's some good resources out there, like um, uh, Stephen Fasciola's uh, book, Cornucopia, I find to be a really good one, um, Sturtevant's Edible Plants of the World. Um, these are great resources for looking at what we're missing, what, are, what aren't we growing that we could be. And the nice thing about uh, cornucopia is that it, it kind of gives you geographical areas and you can match yourself up with a similar place, uh, latitude and rainfall and so forth in China as, say, here, uh, and then look at what they're growing there and such. I was doing a little bit of that when I was in Tibet with looking at some of the Andean crops that, that could be used over there, for example. Um, anyway, his work is, is really interesting because he, he was talking about how uh, a number of things, but they were looking at um, the uh, amino acid um, contents of different foods and combinations of foods and making this assumption that um, when you eat proteins, the body has to break them down into amino acids and kind of skipping that step and, and creating these interesting um, slaws and sauerkrauts and other, other blends of plants that had the full range of what we need in our bodies to more quickly digest and assimilate and build tissues. Uh, that was one thing they were looking at. The, another one was, and they, they found that, um, did an interesting study on open pollinated versus heirloom versus uh, hybrid. And there's these general assumptions that hybrids are more uh, productive, but not necessarily at all at the nutritional level um, or even yield when you start comparing an, a random open pollinated with an heirloom that was selected uh, for specific reasons, they were performing sometimes much better than the, than the uh, and we see that with corn. I mean, a lot of the, the corn growers I, you know, that are feeding animals, uh, they're getting 50% more protein in some of these heirloom corns than, not as many bushels per acre again, but um, anyway, some di different ways to look at it. The other thing he uh, was doing that, Alan Capular, uh, so the other thing he was talking about was how the commons are being uh, enclosed. And if you read that book uh, that I mentioned uh, on shattering, it talks about the corporate buyout of all these seed companies and the, the uh, monopolization of the types of plants you can control better, like the hybrids and the, the genetically engineered. And you get into patenting and the craziness of that. But... Uh, <clears throat> if they want to play that game, we can we can respond. And what I mean by that is that uh, if you patent a hybrid variety, um, it's based on a two gene uniqueness to what you started with. So you've got to prove this two gene uniqueness. And that is generally used to uh, create you know, bushels per acre and uh, adaptation to fungicides and, and other things that are more of an industrial uh, agricultural interest than a consumer's interest, but us as plant uh, breeders, selectors, um, we want to do go back to that disease resistance, insect resistance, nutrition, uh, and now that we have some tools to really start measuring that nutrition, it can be very interesting in the field in real time looking at infrared readings of uh, terpenes and, and all sorts of other uh, antioxidants and such. Um, but selecting their seed plants based on these readings in real time it, it, you know, allows for some fascinating things. But what he was saying is that we can take the patented varieties and select them back toward what we want as consumers, not as industrial uh, profit-minded people. And when we get that two genes uniqueness back, not to what it was, but to what we want it to be, then just naming it. You don't even have to patent it. Just naming it and putting it in the public domain. So it's about you know, looking at this process of enclosing the commons and then releasing it back into the commons. And so there's a whole world of open source 
uh, systems and new tools of, with blockchain and, and so forth that we can put to work um, to uh, expand the commons back to what we need it to be, um, if that makes any sense. So uh, I've been really uh, enjoying working with this variety of corn. It's an eight row flint corn that I believe uh, originated up in this area somewhere in New England, as far as I can tell. Um, and we're using a number of these um, techniques from the, uh, that we're going over with the Bionutrient Food Association and uh, trainings and such, and, and some of the minerals and biology and cover cropping and rotations, and seeing real interesting changes in the plants, uh, epigenetic changes, and the, the, um, some of the pumpkin seeds we're growing, the naked seeded pumpkins that are, there's no hull on them. You can just break a pumpkin open and reach in, get handfuls of really high nutrition, high zinc protein, uh, et cetera, without any processing. So it's a, it's a really nice, and plus you can make oil from it. But the seeds that we got originally in the mail of the variety were, <clears throat> I'd say, half to a third of what they are now in, in only three or four years. So the, um, this kind of gets into Francis Pottinger's work in epigenetics, and uh, one of the interesting things about people familiar with Francis Pottinger, uh, so he, um, he worked with cats and, and animals and things, and it takes like three or four generations to, to really see the intergenerational effects of diet, which is what he was working on. But if you look at <clears throat> this process in, say, a, an annual plant, you're getting uh, kind of the whole cycle within three or four years. So we're seeing big changes in, uh, like I mentioned before, in, in flavor, pigmentation, uh, disease and insect resistance, and shelf life. Huge change in shelf life um, in, in some of the winter squashes and things like that. So that gets back to that storage piece. Um, uh, uh, it's just, uh, it makes phenomenal uh, tortillas and tamales. We do a lot of nixtamalization, so increasing nutrition at kind of three levels. One, at the uh, selection of the seed varieties. Uh, two, in the uh, soil mineral and biological management and, and cover cropping. And then three, in the preparation. In this case, increasing um, <clears throat> a number of factors based on cooking the corn in a alkaline um, material like lime or ashes and um, increasing niacin and zinc and copper and uh, calcium uh, protein. Uh, so you get those three things lined up and you can knock it out of the park nutritionally. We're also working with some of the ancient grains, the older, <coughs> older grains like einkorn and um, turkey red um, are some of the ones we were growing and uh, dry beans. Um, they, these things store all year long and the more I'm traveling a lot, I just don't have time for the day-to-day -day things that need a lot of babying. I can. I can get large amounts planted and I'll have my whole year food supply um, in all these categories. Uh, purchasing some interesting old equipment that doesn't exist anymore, like the, um, <clears throat> the Alice Chalmers All Crop Harvester. They, they'll, you can harvest 100 different types of seeds with it. They've really never made anything like it since. Um, I've been locating a number of those for groups that I'm working with. Uh, while they're still around, precious metals as we call them sometimes. We're moving away from tillage. I'm about a year away from shifting completely to no-till. But these squash, these are butternut squash here, uh, will very rapidly take over this bare ground and, and swallow the whole thing up. But um, in using some uh, of the, the volcanic minerals like carbonatite, you know, we're seeing um, really dramatic uh, results in it, you know, like two or three times the size of the plant uh, of, of, of a control right next to it. And then, um, again, those other qualities following as well. And then we do a lot with buckwheat and uh, now much more in, with these mixes. And so this is probably 10 species of mix in, in last October. Um, we had, um, I mean, this, this is sun hemp here. And it's 12 feet tall there, and so there was 10 other species in the mix, and we just went in by hand. I wasn't—I haven't been doing this that long, so I wasn't sure how to get, you know, 
transition this crop. So I hand sowed the winter cover crop into it and then uh, brush hogged it off. And then the, then the winter cover crop came up through it. And, um, and then the ne next spring turned that under. But now we're, we're kind of getting away from the tillage altogether moving toward planting the following crop straight into it. These are Austrian winter peas. This created a, uh, I did turn this one in, uh, but this is rye and Austrian winter peas. And this uh, allowed for one of the best corn crops we ever had. We haven't used a speck of any kind of even organic fertilizer uh, for at least a dozen years, just, just minerals and cover crops um, at this point. Uh, but that's a great, I mean, that's a very good edible um, plant. In the middle of, uh, of February, uh, across the whole state of Ohio, it was the greenest thing I've seen, and it was the sweetest thing I've ever gotten out of the garden. Yeah? When do you plant that? Um, September, October. Yep. Yeah. And it's, it's hardy, pretty hardy. There's a few different varieties that, that are more hardy. But as our winters are getting milder, it, it seems like we're able to grow more things. Like that sun hemp, we almost got ripe seed this year. And that's like almost unheard of for Ohio. You, you're growing the seed in like Hawaii and stuff. It's a winter pea, but it's delicious. The, the greens are fantastic. You can go, even in February, we were picking baskets of, of greens out of it, you know. So there's a whole, there's a lot to be said for growing these mixes and then going in and grazing out of it. You know, the, the um, daikon radishes and, and so many other things that are in these mixes already and just going in and harvesting uh, before the next crop. So, that's after the corn. We went in on the last cultivation uh, and, and put in um, red clover, threw in red clover seed after the last cultivation so that by the time we picked the corn, the clover was well established. And then this year, we, uh, I'm not used to just turn the clover in for nitrogen, and now I'm just tilling strips into it on our way to no, complete no-till, but tilling strips in and putting the pumpkins and squash in, and then just using wheel hose to, to weed them until they cover up the bare ground and then mow the clover once, and then it covers the whole thing. And we got over 1,000 pounds, those two rows that you saw, uh, it was not the same two rows, but two rows, we got over a thousand pounds with uh, an amazingly small amount of work um, I, I, uh, of squash. Now, so the, the squash went into this clover, so I mowed off the, the corn stalks and then left it over the winter and then just tilled, just rows for the, the planting rows. Um, Do you have any other ideas on planting the squash without tilling? Yes. Yes, I, I will refer, just, I'll refer you. Just press the, the, the clover long enough to get the squash out, right? Not exactly. So there's a paper that was just recently written uh, at Cornell on what they're calling relay cropping. It's basically what Fukuoka was doing, except it's being worked out, you know, how to really do this. Um, and there's a woman in, uh, this was about a, a woman's farm. I think her name is Susanna Lean in uh, Kentucky, um, Salamander Springs Farm. Berea. Yeah, Berea, Kentucky. So uh, that's, that's who I'm looking to next to how to get completely to these systems to no-till. With the dry beans, she's got a good system for dry beans. I'll be working it out for corn and squash as well and uh, some of the others. So it's exciting. It is. Right. Because you're basically just managing these mixes of cover crops and then either sowing right into it. It's broadcast seeding. You're getting away from the whole row idea. And you're broadcasting in, and then you're knocking it down in some way, and then it's coming up through that mulch. Or you're knocking it down and then planting with no-till planters. There's a little no-till planter, like a three-footer that I'm looking at, um, I believe, out of uh, Pennsylvania. A lot of times when I'm looking for the right equipment, it's always too big. You know, you, you have a hard time finding something that's in that sort of 20, 30 horsepower range. Um, and there's this little, I think it's called an ESCH, -E no-till drill. I mean, if you're doing it on a small enough scale, you can get around the equipment altogether just by people. You know, you can take a 55-gallon drum with a handle and some water in it and push it over the, the cover crop to lay it down and then just dibble plant into it or sow the seed in. There's a lot of ways to do this. Um, but um, I think uh, a lot of people are working on the no-till stuff, and it's, 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 it can be tricky on the larger scale, but uh, many people are getting it, uh, getting it down. Uh, Brian O'Hara, who's 
here not presenting this year, but uh, he's got a new book coming out. Uh, he's done fantastic uh, work on this for vegetables. Um, so these are the pumpkins, the naked seeded pumpkins. They're vining varieties, so they take up a lot of space. There are some bush varieties, I'm told, by Will Bonzel that um, might be able to be much more um, productive per unit of area. We got a lot of area, so it's not a big deal for us. Um, but they're, uh, they're pretty fantastic in terms of the uh, oil production and uh, food value for almost very little work. I mean, you, you still have these sessions of sitting around with hatchets and, and spoons and buckets and, and whatnot, but uh, hey, it's good stuff. They're very, very nutritious. So also perennials integrated into these uh, uh, landscapes and lots of mushrooms. Um, I think mushrooms are way underutilized in general in, in, uh, for almost everything we're doing. Um, as we're applying some of these um, applications of biochar and looking at bioremediation, um, fantastic potential there. I, uh, three years ago, I was asked to implement a grant on working with farmers and using biochar to establish the economic value of it because people generally don't know how to use it. And so I went through a whole series of um, dairy farms, beef operations, poultry, row crops, and vegetable operations. And um, on some of the dairies, for example, I, there was a small Amish dairy that was right close to the creek, and the manure was clearly running into the creek. And so I worked with the, with the grower, and um, we came up with a fairly simple system um, of pouring a cement pad between the barn and the bedding pack, which didn't have a roof, so a, a, a roof on the bedding pack and a uh, a cement pad in between, and then we set it so that it, the runoff would go into a 240-gallon tote, um, and then I asked him to also put a small constructed wetland in. I built some of these with the same roofing rubber for a five-bedroom house for um, a, a sewage treatment system. It's been working for 30 years perfectly. Um, so even without the constructed wetland, by the next year, there was zero runoff uh, just with biochar in that 240-gallon tote that the water was running into and basically totally treating it, but also uh, saving the nutrients for the farm that went back into this, his composted manure pile. Um, there's... Um, also, his brother had a larger operation, a little more complex, and it was, um, he had a manure pond that he, he, he wanted the manure to go in, some of the manure to go into, because he had a windmill that was pumping the manure water up into the pastures to water with. Um, but the problem was, the, the, um, when there was no wind and there was a lot of rain, it was overflowing. So we set up a... Um, a plan for a bioswale with biochar and inoculated mushroom, uh, inoculated wood chips uh, and staked uh, straw bales uh, to be able to treat that situation. And when you start looking at what you can do here, you like everything becomes a filtering process, but it's also a harvesting process of nutrients. So you're um, in some of the bigger systems, like in the poultry operations I've been looking at, and I wouldn't necessarily I, I wouldn't design them this way, but once they are, if you're, if you're uh, going back in and, and kind, kind of retrofitting the best you can do, <clears throat> I don't know if people have <clears throat> seen these larger poultry systems, but um, there's a lot of birds in a, in, a, in a confined building, and the ammonia levels build up, and when they build up to a certain level, they've got sensors, and uh, they open up vents and turn on fans, and when it's 55 degrees outside or colder, the propane heaters kick on. So what are you doing? You're blowing uh, NO2 and other you know, smog-related uh, materials into the atmosphere um, using electricity and using fracked gases. So with, with some biochar on the bedding, it will absorb the nitrogen in the form of ammonia for future use in your compost pile or in your field, and you're saving the, the fan electricity and the, um, the heating 
that, that was blowing out the window that doesn't blow out the window if you don't need to reduce the methane, right? And so you still have some ventilation in there, but it's easy to do at that level. And so I was visiting uh, some friends, um, a friend of mine, Phil Blome, who's got a, a biochar company. And um, this kind of gets into the next subject a little bit, but he uh, took me to this, to this guy who's manufacturing the, what I consider next level um, biochar systems. And they're, they're basically wood chip, uh, low pressure boilers that are able to have integrated um, organic Rankine cycle engines or Stirling engines um, and absorption chillers integrated it, integrated into it. So this is how we get to cooling um, for mainly food preservation is my interest. I mean, you could do air conditioning if you want. Um, but so when I uh, was talking to him, I was looking at his, his brother's farm had 10 greenhouses being heated by one of these boiler systems with uh, large piles of wood chips, which are available endlessly in that part of the Ozarks. And um, he was running this boiler and heating these 10 greenhouses, and he was making huge amounts of biochar. He had 40-some acres of vegetables. He was using it in the soil, but he was, had more than he needed, so he was sold a triaxle load to this guy with the poultry farm that I went to see, which was interesting because I... I was a state away from there, and he was in, that was in Iowa, and I was on my way to Colorado, and he told me the guy's name, and I was inspecting organic farms on the way out and on the way back, and when I looked at my paperwork on the way home, it was the same guy, so I was going to this farm anyway. But when I went there and I looked at the, the savings that I just mentioned with the, with the ammonia and the, um, the savings of energy and, and gases, and I said, well, how much money are you spending on that walk-in cooler a year to keep the eggs cold so that the truck comes twice a week to pick them up? And we started looking at that cost. And then we said, oh, how much are you spending on propane uh, to heat this thing uh, in the winter? And how much are you spending for electricity? And then how much did you spend on the biochar? So at that point, you start seeing this economic return where if you were just making it right there and, and capturing the heat and the electricity and, the, uh, and making biochar and absorbing the methane and so forth, the whole thing starts becoming very interesting in terms of the economic flows. Um, it's not generally the way people think, but if you're looking at whole systems and, and looking at where the leaks in that system are and how you can capture those, you know, and, then, and actually the return on investment starts looking very good if you add the whole thing up right. Uh, so we've been doing, you know, tabling for the Bionutrient Food Asso Association at different events and just going through, you know, seeds and minerals and results and, and the whole thinking of it. Um, and uh, it's been interesting and fun. You can see the, some of the, the real, the, the larger seed varieties of the, of the corn that I say for seed. That's just uh, amazing. Um, when you start seeing and tasting and, and um, you know, getting the feedback from, from these techniques, it, it, it's habit forming. So we've been hosting some workshops on conversions of, you know, electric tractors. This was a tractor some guys in Mississippi made with off-the-shelf um, technologies for Cuba they designed it for, and they were demoing it that, that particular day, um, and we were interested in converting it to electricity. So for cultivation and smaller horsepower tractors, I think electricity is the way to go. Um, it gets into battery technology and some things like that, but the torque and everything is very good, and we have lots of extra solar that you can charge the batteries on an electric tractor, say, when your house batteries are, when my house batteries are full, I go through all the whole gamut of what do I do with it. With, with the extra, right? So I've got, you know, after you've pumped your water and vacuumed your floor and done your laundry and everything else you can think of, and I've got wood chippers and log splitters, and um, I just bought a really nice coffee roaster that's um, uh, another way to use it. But after all of that, then you could have it just automatic, or if I'm not home, I could have it be plugged into an electric tractor and be charging the batteries on it. And what you have there is a, a second battery bank on wheels that you can use for anything that you would use the tractor for or plug it back into the house and use it if you need it there. So it's just flexible storage again and energy storage. This is uh, another friend that uh, converted a Alice Chalmers G uh, cultivating tractor. Um, we're really wanting to get to the, a PTO with enough power to make wood chips. 
And I don't think that we're going to get that with, ele with electricity. I think we're going to so, but where I think we're going to go with that next, the, the plan on the table is to get a probably 50, 60 horsepower tractor and convert it to wood gasification with chunks, with wood chunks. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with Wayne Keith down in Mississippi, but he's, uh, he's famous for gasifying his truck and driving 80 miles an hour. <laughs> uh, it, it, they've got, uh, they got a workshop videotaped free that you want, if you want to watch it at uh, Living Web Farms down in North Carolina, people I'm working with um, more and more these days, um, doing some really good work. Um, anyway, if we can gasify uh, the, the larger horsepower tractors to get the horsepower to do the heavy lifting work on these farms and then use that to run the chippers to chip the wood that comes from these landscapes that I mentioned thinning in the forest and that whole piece, uh, but we have this other story of, of being able to integrate tree plantings into uh, silvopastoral systems uh, and not only the fodder, but the coppicing and pollarding plants that you can uh, constantly harvest and utilize and use the shade when you need it and cut it, actively manage it, cut it back and, and derive these uh, wood chips and, and materials to make biochar and bioenergy and electricity and all the things that we need in the farm. So that's kind of where we're going with it. Um, so we've been having fun with these different types of cookers and gasifiers. And uh, this is a friend of mine, Gary Gilmore. We just did this uh, workshop where he designed this Gilmore gasifier. And uh, this one here will run anything up to about 18 horsepower. This system does use charcoal so that you're, you are burning it, some of it to ash by getting this part done which is a bit of a compromise because we really want to see that get back to the soil eventually in some form. Um, but you got to get stuff done on the farm and instead of, you know, if you can't get diesel and you, or, you, uh, or you can't afford it, um, this is how the show can go on. And, and so we were recently making, um, we fired up the gasifier and fired up the electric chainsaw and cut the wood and loaded the 55 gallon drum to make the biochar for the next thing. And uh, it, it's an economy. It, it, and you can get uh, pretty much whatever you need done eventually. I mean, we're on the front end of this whole thing, and so it's, these are all prototypes. I'm beta testing the first of its kinds, the Stirling engine with the electricity uh, integrated. We have some things to work out on it, of course, but just like every movement, I mean, if you look back, say, 40, 50 years ago at the, the beginnings of the alternative energy movement or the beginnings of, uh, you know, herbal not that it was the beginning of herbal medicine, but the popularity of herbal medicine or the um, alter alternative uh, energy stuff that was what you could get off the shelf now in terms of organic gardening, farming products, in terms of uh, you know, sophisticated inverters and, and so forth. And, the, and that, that's a huge amount of change that happened in 40 or 50 years. And if you think about how few people really drove that, it was the early adopters and the the, the beta testers that are working out the kinks for everybody else, and that's kind of where we're at with, with this technology, but um, it feels like the right stuff for me, and it fits really nicely with um, the bottleneck that I have in the wintertime um, in my off-grid system. So um, it fits perfectly for that. Anyway, this is, this is another uh, really efficient little cook stove. It's um, a champion cook stove. Paul Anderson, I believe University of Illinois, designed it. There was a, ch uh, it was a challenge worldwide to build the, the cleanest burning, most efficient cook stove, particularly for um, developing countries and particularly for women who are cooking over smoke fires and the, uh, the eye problems and respiratory problems that arise from that. Uh, but we've been doing a really fun workshop here lately with uh, the stuff I was mentioning with the corn, where we go over the genetics of the seed in the corn in the beginning and then go out in the field and look at the soils and the cover crops and all that and then go into the um, the shed and, uh, and have these tables laid out where you've got a corn shiller on one end of the table and you've got a, um, a pot of cooked corn in the, in the uh, lime, nixtamalized process, and then you have it washed and then you have a grinder there and we have a cordless drill, solar charged cordless drill to grind that. You can do it by hand too. Uh, and then basically the masa and then it, uh, a, a hand crank tortilla maker and you put it in there and then you've got this thing going with the comal on it and it's burning 
it's burning the corn cobs from the corn that you just put in the other end, right? So, <laughs> and so you're, you're putting in the corn in there, you see it in the field, and you put it in there and it comes out a hot tortilla and it's being cooked on the fuel from the, the corn cobs and you've made the charcoal out for the, the biochar out of the corn cobs. So uh, it's just a, a quick example of how these whole cycles work. Yes, yes, this makes nice biochar. This is a champion stove. It's, um, um, I think they're out there. I had to track mine down. I called Paul Anderson in, in Illinois, and he said, oh, you're going to have to get a hold of these people in India that uh, made them. And then they, and I, I contacted them by email or something, and then I it went to California, and somebody had a bunch of them out there. So they can be found. Uh, the people I'm working with at Living Web have designed a heavier-duty kind of uh, iron version of it. This one's nice because it's real mobile. You can take it wherever you want to go, uh, but does a fantastic job. Bamboo burns really nice in it. It's like rocket fuel. Uh, 130 bucks maybe, or 120. But these things can be made. There's a lot. There's a whole underground thing on biochar these days. And if you go on YouTube, you know, you can build your own if you want. Yep. So this is when I really need that. Uh, this this next little technology. You know, my you can see my solar panels on the roof are covered in snow, and I climb out there a lot and clean it off if I have to, and I do that a fair bit. Um, but this is where um, the bottleneck occurs. I mean, that's a nice sunny day. If I go out there and clean it off, I'll get sun. But there's days that are cloudy for way too long, and uh, the batteries are running too low. And I can conserve. I've lived without it, so it's not a big deal for me. But I do like being able to fill this gap when you already are burning wood to make heat, that you can burn the wood and get electricity and heat and biochar. It's just a natural evolution uh, of, of thinking. Um, so this is, a, this is a saltwater manganese carbon battery that is uh, pretty much a complete breakthrough in battery technology as far as I'm concerned. Uh, c totally benign materials, nothing toxic, nothing outgassing, nothing that can explode, no maintenance. And the problem that I was having with lead acid batteries, I mean, there's a whole long list of them, but basically when you get... Um, when, you, when you're using 6-volt batteries and you're creating a chain to get 48 volts and one battery goes bad in that chain, you're not supposed to put new batteries in with old batteries, so you're in this quandary uh, you know, uh, of having to buy a new battery because you've got seven ones that are still good and one, one new battery, but if you put that in there, you're sort of compromising it and stuff. It's, it's plus all the nasty acid problems that, that come with it and the explosion potential and the lead in it and so forth. This is like all the way out of that world because each one of these batteries is a 48-volt stack. You know, so if one goes bad, it's no big deal. Um, and they will probably last a very long time. Um, so the other thing is that you can... Uh, it's an Aquion battery. I'll tell you the rest of the story because they, they went bankrupt, but they're out of bankruptcy. They just haven't released the new form factor yet, A-Q-U-I-O-N. Uh, but so with lead-acid batteries, you have to set your, your, your charging rate to basically 50%. When it runs down to 50%, you've got to charge those batteries. These have no problem of going all the way to 100. You won't hurt them. And they also, a lead-acid battery loses 50% of its power at 32 degrees. Uh, it does get that cold in my house sometimes when I'm not around, um, <laughs> if, if I'm not around to, to make a fire. But it's uh, rarely. Anyway, these can go much cooler without losing much of its power, too. So they're just, they're just amazing. And so when you combine the solar panel, solar panels with these kinds of batteries, you've got a really nice base storage system, except you still have this gap in the winter. So this is the first <coughs> beta testing unit uh, of a free piston Stirling engine. It was, uh, the, this free piston Stirling engine was designed um, in the town where I live, um, by a guy who's recently passed away, but some of the uh, engineers who worked with him are, have put this together. And basically, um, the rights to the Sterling engine were sold to the Netherlands, and, and they're being re-imported. We're kind of working with them on, um, on this and some other applications. 
I wonder if this would be a good, I've got a little video of this running if we want to watch it. Um, but basically what's happening is that you've got uh, wood pellets in here and an auger that feeds up here and, and an auger that comes through this burner process and the temperature zone right in here gets to where the gases are coming out of the wood. And the gases go off into a drum over here and you've got about 1850 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, then you have a Stirling engine underneath here that gets cranked up into place when your temperatures are right and the differential between that 1850 degrees and the base of the Stirling engine is what it runs on, the, that differential. And so water, water cooling, uh, so you're, you're running water through that base. You're cooling the base, so the differential between the hot end and the co cooler end, and it runs a piston in a helium cylinder that um, makes 1,000 watts of electricity it's not a huge amount at one time like a generator that you'd think about, but it's accumulative for somebody like me that has batteries. So it's 24 hours a day. So you're getting 24 kilowatts a day of electricity. And that's conjunction with whatever sunlight's happening too, right? So, um, and then it's, it's dropping biochar into this chamber. So every 12 hours, you just pull that handle and you get 12 pounds of biochar. Uh, uh, I believe that is mine. It, this was at the shop where they were building it. There's only two out there. there I bought one of them, and I got uh, Living Web Farms one down in North Carolina. And the third one is going to uh, the Netherlands, I think. Uh, it's a company. I have flyers. I can bring them. I should have brought them today. Um, I will be around the next few days if you want to flag me down, or we're doing a another panel discussion tomorrow. Um, if people are interested, just talk to me. I'll, I'll, I'll give you my contact. What's the system called? Um, it's called a Biogen. The, the Stirling engine itself is a Microgen, is the company in, in the Netherlands. This is a Biogen. The other ones that we're going to be building are going to be way more flexible in the sense that this requires dry wood pellets or it's been tested on walnut hulls. So there's a, some cool stuff we could start thinking about with, with walnuts planted in a poultry system. Uh, Reginaldo's workshop coming up, we'll talk a lot about this. I'd highly recommend checking him out, um, working with him as well. Uh, but where you've got walnuts in a poultry type system and then the, you can press the oil from the walnuts and use the, um, the meat and the, and the shell mix in a poultry system, let them pick out the meat and then dry it and run it through something like this and still get all your other byproducts from it, biochar and energy and such, right? So um, that, that, those larger systems though are gonna be, I mean, I'm just designing it right now, but basically uh, it can use up to 65% moisture instead of dry, can use chips instead of pellets because there's an energy factor in there if you're trying to pelletize bamboo or sawdust or, or whatever else you're pelletizing, agricultural waste products. All doable, but it's there, you have to factor in the energy involved. Um, it uses um, energy to run it or, or wood to run it. Under 200 watts. The net is more like 800, if, if, uh, but we're, this is all in flux because they've already made a DC version of this. So I don't want to go into the electrical engineering of this, but it's been about a year of some pretty complex stuff in terms of making my own 220 signal that this thing requires a narrow band of 220. And when I put a big load in my house, it knocks it out of that, that range because I'm making my own 220 with an auto transformer, right? So there's a thing called a grid independent module that are just coming out. We just put an order in for three of them and that'll get us around all the DC stuff. I mean, all the AC stuff. And uh, so you either have to have two, right now you either have to have a, two inverters, which I've already got an inverter. I make all my own AC power in the house from the batteries. But instead of use, what I did was I tried to use that with, um, to make my own AC 220 from that rather than putting a separate inverter just for 220, just to, just to serve that Stirling engine and to receive back the power in 220 and then put it back into the batteries. 
<laughs> I don't want to nerd out too bad on you here, but there's a little bit, there's a little bit of complexity, and we want to get them simpler. But the other one is um, is larger, it's scalable. It, it it can have three inch and smaller wood chips, up to 65% moisture, uh, and we can integrate the coolers and the electricity, and uh, and also size them with an internal firebox that's smaller, so you can run it at a smaller scale for a while, but if you want to step it up, you can actually have a gas output from it where you're burning more wood than you need to run the, the heating and cooling and be able to run a large uh, whatever you want, large wood chipping operation or any kind of you know, semi-industrial process. How much time? One, it takes a, a pretty good hour and a half to get it going. Uh, once it's on to, so it's in manual mode while you're running it, you're putting in some biochar to prime up here in, in this thing and you're lighting things. And, and, uh, and, but once, it's, once the temperatures are lined up and you've got it running on automatic, um, really every 12 hours you've got to take out biochar until there's a design change to, to auger that. Uh, like the bigger one doesn't have that. It has, um, it's got a, an, a, a, a continuous flow. Oh, it's using six pounds of pellets an hour to make a thousand watts and eight and a half times that much hot water. Um, that, that hopper is probably at least five days. But you could make any size hopper you want. But you're still going to have to get 12 hours <laughs> get the biochar out of there. Um, that's, but that's a design thing. Some of these are, you know, this part of it is, is easy to redesign. So if you had w regular wood chips with this, and they have tested it in North Carolina already on some wood chips, but uh, it's possible we have to use one, one of these with a slightly bigger diameter um, to match the, the density of the, the fuel that you're using. So anyway. I don't want to get too stuck on the, the very first model here, but just to say that it, it's happening, it's been done, the concept is interesting, and we're going to have to work out all the other stuff with you know, getting enough people playing ball to bring the prices down. You know, that first Bic pen was like 20 bucks, and you know, you, in order to get that price down, you've got to have a lot of production. Um, so we're all... Yeah. This is probably six figures? Or? No, it's 15000 so before, I, I'll get you in a minute. So the thing about that is, back to the batteries, these get about 3,000 full depth cycles, and they're about 1,000 bucks a piece. So if, you know, most uh, average home would probably have, uh, it, may, it might be 1,200 when they, when they come out again. But the, um, most houses would probably have about 12 of these. Now if you do the math on that, most of your cycling is going to happen in the winter months when you don't have much power because the sun is topping them up every day, you know, almost eight, eight months a year, eight to nine months a year. So I'm only using th that for like three to four months because I just don't need it. Uh, however, if we get into cooling and things like that, then it would be more relevant in the warmer weather, right? So if you are cycling th your, most of your depth cycling in the wintertime, and you're running the Stirling engine to keep them topped up, I think conservatively you're going to get twice the, the time out of these batteries. And that pays for itself right there in batteries alone. Okay, so just, just a little. Uh, I'm saying that the batteries will last you a lot. Well, you're going to use, I mean, you're using some power the rest of the year. It's, right, not, it's right. not like you're topping. I, I'm just saying that I think that the cost is offset of the Stirling engine by your, the yeah, longevity yeah. of your batteries. But you do also don't need as many batteries. Uh, that's an, actually another piece. But uh, So this is the, the bigger systems. This one here was running 10 full-size greenhouses, uh, heating 10 full-size greenhouses with a, a, a water boiler uh, using um, that container was getting filled once a day with a front end loader from a big pile of chips behind it and the auger was feeding that and then there was, that was the footprint of where all the biochar was sitting before they ran it over to the poultry farm that I was talking about. So pretty sizable and, and uh, you know, again, there's other designs to, for, 
greenhouse design that aren't as needy for heating. You know, battery, um, thermal battery design greenhouses that bank the heat of the day in the ground and then blow it back out at night. So we can optimize these systems from the beginning so they don't need as much, but um, just trying to kind of get the thinking out there in general rather than getting stuck too much on exact examples. Um, so this one is running, this is about the size that I th I'm thinking about um, for a prototype. Um, this one here is running on sawdust and it doesn't make biochar, but we, it's not too hard to get it to where, you use about 25% more wood chips to make biochar than one that's you, you know, just burning to ash. And that, that difference is completely valuable. I mean, as far as like you, to use to, the 25%, what you get from that 25% more is, is fantastic, especially when you're thinking about up to, I mean, well, look at the time, look at how long that charcoal is in the soil. Uh, you can't even do that math. You know, how do you calculate soil fertility 2,000 years out? And why does the farmer have to pay for it, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, farmers are, are already taking the risk for the rest of the society for, you know, climatic variations and pest problems and everything else. And then we're talking about having them, you know, buy their own biochar. It's the whole society should be, you know, it, I wouldn't call that a subsidy. I would call that a service that um, mm -hmm. is being paid for. Um, so anyway, there's a whole conversation around economics and agriculture and how messed up it is and what it needs to be and how it can get there. And we'll hopefully end on that point. Problem is that the, 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 the oil burner is only doing heat. And so we're looking at potentially electricity and cooling and, um, and all these other factors. So you'd have to do a lot of math to actually compare those things. I couldn't answer that right offhand. All I can say is this is way more efficient, especially if you assign some value to that carbon. If you go to some of these archaeological digs, you know, thousands of years old, you see the charcoal is in those fire pits, right? It, it hasn't broken down. So uh, it, it's going to be around for a long time, serving um, biological systems. Um, so I guess I'll end. Yeah, I was recently up in Vermont with um, Walter Yenne, I mentioned, for four days. And there was a presentation by Abe Collins. People know Abe uh, in, up in Vermont. Um, and I was pretty impressed with what they're beginning to move into in terms of measurement. Um, John, I think you wanted to know this information when I mentioned to you the other day. Um, this is the, the folks that are, are doing the... Um, about 12 measurements of watershed function um, and ground truthing the, the measurements, uh, soil, uh, looking at soil water infiltration, soil surface temperature, soil uh, organic matter, uh, rate of biomass growth in the area, communicating with satellites, and you know, about 12 different parameters, and all kind of crunched into one number of kind of, a, of watershed health. And one of the reasons I think this is so important is that I think we're at a real tipping point and there's a complete parallel between um, the, the economics of health problems today. I don't know if people are following this, but the, the rate of increase of autism and diabetes and cancer and all these things. And it's getting down to where single diseases could take our whole economy down. Uh, when you project it out. There was like one out of 150,000 people autistic in about 30 years ago and is like one out of 35 or something now and it's going to like one out of three in the next 25 years. Um, that, if you run the numbers of, of healthcare out on these things and then look at diabetes, it's, it's the same story. There's no way to treat our way out, treat symptoms and treat our way out of this problem. There's no uh, healthcare systems on earth that can touch it. Um, it, probably the rest of the world probably couldn't take care of the United States. And so um, the parallel with that in the climatic story with the 500 year floods coming every three years and the, um, the fires and the droughts and the mitigation money that's being spent out and the insurance money being spent out, uh, it's, it's the same pattern. And so the thing that's so significant about this to me is that they're being able to measure, um, say, water, almost water infiltration alone. Uh, when you look at farms like Gabe Brown's farm that, that absorbed, a, I believe it was a 13-inch rainfall event in, in a 24-hour cycle and 
had virtually no runoff and still got a crop out of it, um, compared with um, the neighboring farm that was underwater and then replanted after the event and then had that crop die in the, drought, in the following drought because that's what comes after the, the, the flood. Um, what they're showing is that if you aggregate enough land that has high levels of water infiltration in the same 13 inch rain or whatever inch rain, okay, uh, then you won't have that money. You won't have the, the, the money to spend on flooding and you won't have the following money on droughts and then the forest fires that come after that. Um, so we need to get ahead of this in a prevention context. Um, and I think this is the beginning of the metrics and the similar metrics as the infrared um, bionutrient meter to show that there's hundreds of times more antioxidants and polyphenols in a product um, that we can begin to move the investors and the insurance companies over away from the status quo because they're super attached at, at present. They don't know what else to do. And it's, I think it's up to us to be innovating and, and show that um, you know, if you have that kind of nutrition in your food, you won't have those following medical bills and so forth. Or if you can aggregate groups of people to do this kind of work, hire farmers at, at you know, a fraction of a percentage of the same money you would have spent on mitigating um, then we can pay farmers well for things that, that they should be being paid for uh, if they're doing that work and we can con make it contingent upon the actual measurements and metrics. So uh, I think we're entering a new time here in terms of what some of these abilities are, that we have are and the ripening of the mindset of the people being, okay, we see it now you know, as it's getting more and more graphic. Um, so they're, they're basically... Um, doing a lot of the right work in grazing systems and, um, and, and like I mentioned, the, uh, looking at all the values of the ecosystem services and the cultural and, and uh, other, other aspects and the, what's being reduced and what's being increased and really starting to really put a, a value on that natural capital we talked about uh, early on in the talk. So I will try to... Um, so you can see where you know how it can increase the, the target goals and uh, you know map out where a, a region is in this case Vermont presently where it can go how to get it there how to get the money uh, theoretically it's that part's not there quite yet but I think it's getting close and then reducing the the negatives and, and the risks um, in the same conversation. So it, it, you, it's going to have to be, <coughs> there's a number of, of, of places potentially, um, but I think it's, it's in the, the shifting of the, um, the way money is being spent on public uh, expenses in, for insurance and so forth on um, these floods, droughts, and fire mitigation events that, you know, it'll, at some point it's going to become really clear that there is no money to continue that way. Yeah, I'll finish on that and we'll go right into questions. Let's see, I think that was pretty much that. Yeah, the idea is there to hire farmers and land managers. This could go into some kind of a new green deal and CCC, you know, bring some kind of a new uh, civilian conservation corps back out to work with farmers, but get the job done, hire it out. As far as I know, yes, they're just mapped. They're doing the measurements, but the funding needs to happen. Uh, that was it. So we'll... Um, so the idea there was that 40% of the agricultural, industrial agricultural system is being uh, wasted through losses, and that could be recouped by some of the work that you're doing, right? I mean, um, you're able to um, dry, freeze, not freeze dry, but um, puree and dry and store food for long term, which ties into definitely um, more economic value, but also plays into the storage part of this conversation very well. I, I agree, and I would maybe reframe that as uh, that we need to internalize externalities in our, in our economic systems and value, which was back to what I think I said early on about currency, having to be able to uh, be valued based on uh, natural capital. If you, don't, if you decouple those, then you uh, are set up for exactly where we are. But if you couple them and say the nation's topsoils were eroded, your currency would be worth less or vice versa. And I think that's what you're getting at. And I 100% agree. I think we have a 
serious problem with the way we commodify things, that commodities do not reflect processes, communities, ecosystems, et cetera. And uh, I think we, there's going to be some people talking about currency, uh, and monetary reform, and things like that here. And so that, there's a whole conversation there that I think is quite important. Um, and, I, and I agree. On the, on the health piece? Yeah. Yeah. Health yeah. So about a week. Insurance companies became your BFA partners. So yes. <laughs> yeah. Not, not quite there yet. But I was uh, just about a week and a half ago, I was um, at, a, at a conference with uh, a guy named Dr. Stephen Finney. If you might want to check him out. He is working with re, uh, reversing type 2 diabetes with um, looking at diet. Uh, and how, where, right where those turning points are, and they've developed a system, an app, that is, is usable by the person at home to measure their blood sugar and things like that. And it is, doctors are involved, but they're not, people aren't going to the doctor's office and, and tying up all this time driving and parking and, and the doctor's time, but they're checking in online. They've got a whole support system of nurses, doctors, and other informational support. And they've got good data going out two years out of, of getting people pretty much off their meds or really reducing them, and, um, and two years out holding that up with this system. And he was really surprised. He was telling me that he thought that the doctor system was going to work better, and what they found was actually the opposite, that it was more efficient. This came out of a Swedish guy who was telling him that there's no way you, can, you can't deal with this onset of symptoms uh, with what you're doing. You're going to need to have this app system to be able to address it. Um, so <laughs> Stephen Finney, he's got a couple books out. Yeah, he's, I can't remember the name of his... Um, his company. He's got a, a healthcare company, but you'll you'll find him if you look. I think we had one here, and then so another example of how we can get ahead of the diabetes piece of this, and we have to go down that whole list and look at each one, and then look at the causation. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of this is tracking back to glyphosate, unfortunately, but. Um, uh, yeah, the, the basic idea is we do have options that can work, but the present system of just treating symptoms is 100% not going to work. Um, so getting ahead of this is a really important. Let's see, we had over here a few. I, I think you were first, or somebody. Yeah, there's, I believe there's two books out on Terra Preta. One is through Acres, uh, Acres USA, uh, their book source. Um, there's another one that's a little older. Peter, you might know. Uh, uh, Albert's book, it is, uh, so he's got, Albert Bates has got a couple books out. I'm not sure how much Terra Preta has covered, maybe the first one more. There's a lot of resources on biochar, like um, uh, International Biochar Initiative has a website that's got a lot. There's, uh, there's a whole bunch of scientific papers. Ithaca Journal. Ithaca Journal is a very, is a very yep, that's a very good one. Um, not necessarily specifically on Terra Preta, but um, yeah, you have to burrow a little bit, but it's, uh, it's emerging. Yeah, Let's see, and I got gotcha. you, I, and I, I agree. And I, <clears throat> I don't think there's a real simple answer to it other than when hunger starts kicking in, people will get motivated. But the, uh, the, the problem as I see it is that we're seeing a mitochondrial collapse uh, of energy. And it's not just mitochondria, it's the, Bad information people have had about fats. It's bad information about sunlight. It's bad information about walking barefoot, <laughs> or, or you know. So we there's there's energetics coming from electrons in the ground and and infrared light from the from the sun that's part of our energy system. But I think that people are actually desperately avoiding physical work, not just because it's cultural and not just because uh, they're on the computer. I think they're on the computer screens because it's easier than the other things. And so the, the, way to really, the way to really get out of this is to get nutrient-dense food into people. And you'll see this, you'll, I, I believe you'll see this change uh, quite quickly. I've actually watched it. Uh, but it's a, it's a complex subject that probably needs a whole session. Um, I think that the, the thermal battery, the thermal battery greenhouse design, um, Rocky Mountain Institute, Jerome, yeah. Jerome I think that's a, 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 an important starting point. You want to minimize the higher energy uses you know, as much as possible. But um, then to 
augment that, depending on how well you nail that in terms of if you need a little bit of heat, I think something like this could be very interesting, especially if you are using the biochar and you need the electricity for other aspects of maybe the home that's connected to that greenhouse and things like that. So there's a lot of uh, economics, home economics to work out in that system. The biothermal uh, option is also quite good. Uh, um, basically making uh, wood chip pile compost or, wood or other types of compost and running uh, water tubes through it lower down the slope that'll thermosiphon automatically without any pumping. So you can get, if, you, if all you want to do is heat um, and, and you're going to make some compost anyway, uh, there's, that's an interesting one to look at. So there's a, there's a whole suite of, of choices that you have to just kind of pick and choose and put them together and integrate them. Um, but I would say you could do, the, depending on the greenhouse you're talking about, I don't know what you're growing. Is it tropicals? Is it just, because you, you don't even need heat for a lot of production. Um, I've got friends that are doing significant production all winter long with unheated greenhouses. There's techniques for that. If, yeah, that's where I've been, I've been basically promoting that Sterling engine system for the, for the greenhouse that starts and then you move them to the unheated greenhouses after, but you're, you're basically using a nursery or a, a chicken uh, brooding uh, process as well is where you need uh, some heat. But uh, yeah, that's also a good project to, needs to, we need to work on. I'm looking at it a lot. Yep. Okay, I don't think I'm doing a good job of repeating questions, but a lot of them are comments anyway. Uh, so hopefully the, uh, it's, some of that's getting picked up. Uh, any... You're welcome.